It has been a while since Vanderbilt has knocked off a top 10 team at home. You have to go back 45 years for the last time that happened. The opportunity is there for the winless Commodores. LS LSU looks to prove that they remain among the nation's elite. Welcome to Nashville, everybody. Tom Hart alongside Jordan Rogers. We'll get to Cole Kublik in just LSU a moment. Is this is not your Cold dad's Jordan. LSU offense or your uncle's or your brother's. In fact, this is Joe Burrow's offense, and it's proven to be through the air the best in the country. And an offense that we didn't know what was going to look like, and now we can firmly say this offense is electric. It's dynamic. The addition of Joe Brady as the passing game coordinator from the Saints has completely changed this offense, but especially Joe Burrow. He is playing at a higher level than any coordinator quarterback in the entire country watching film backs it up the stats back it up he's dropping dimes all over the field and it's really the offense that is setting him up to succeed they don't need to run the football anymore when have we ever said that at LSU well things have certainly changed Joe Burrow leading the country in completion percentage 83 percent and he's already thrown for over a thousand yards he's got plenty of weapons to work with Meanwhile, on the other side for Vanderbilt, Derek Mason has to figure out how to slow this LSU offense down. And through two games this season, Vanderbilt's defense hasn't slowed anybody down. Georgia ran for 325 against him. Purdue threw for 500 against him. He wants to do something different. How different can Vandy's defense be? Well, they've had two weeks to prepare. And if you look at that Purdue game, nothing works. They couldn't cover on the back end. So if you look at history, for the LSU offense and the small sample size that we have against Texas, they had success early getting pressure on Joe Burrow. I think this difference that Derek Mason and Tarver are talking about is pressure. I expect them to bring pressure as much as possible against Joe Burrow to try to affect the game. They can't sit back there and let him pick them apart. LSU's defense will be on the field to start. For more on that, let's go down to the field and Cole. Tom, a big get back for Dave Aranda and a maybe get back for Dave Aranda. Caleb on chase on outside linebacker defensive end will be available if needed. And Michael Divinity returns did not play last week due to a coach's decision. Not going to be at inside linebacker, though. A little bit of a position change. He'll spend the entire game at outside linebacker as LSU tries to ramp up the pass rush with only four defenders. All right. Awesome. And good morning for Music City. The LSU faithful have taken over the town as expected. LSU had key players out last week. Caleb on chase on expected to return today. We'll see if that comes to fruition as they look to get a pass rush against Vandy. LSU won the toss. They've deferred, so Vandy will receive. Early estimates, 90% of the crowd in purple and gold. Avery Atkins will kick us off just as... Shelton Mosley, the Harvard transfer, won't have a chance to return. New quarterback this season for the Vanderbilt Commodores, Riley Neal, transfer from Ball State. He's on the Johnny Unitas watch list. He's from Yorktown, Indiana. Loves fishing and golf when he's away from football. Had a big growth spurt as he got into high school and took over. Grad transfer where he threw for career high 402 yards and four touchdowns against Kent State. Last September. I think two weeks ago against Purdue, throwing for over 379 yards, excuse me, 78, was a huge confidence booster for Riley Neal. Let's see if he can continue in that trend. He's got a great running back behind him, Keyshawn Vaughn. And Vaughn will get an early touch and a huge hole for Keyshawn Vaughn. Vaughn into the secondary and finally taken down by Christian Fulton. It's a 41-yard walk. You're going to see number eight linebacker on the left side of your screen there, Patrick McQueen. He picks the wrong hole, and it busts wide open for Keyshawn Vaughn. You cannot give him a step. He's dangerous. Longest run of the year for Vandy. Now they swing it to the outside. Kalija Lipscomb, a New Orleans native, is able to take it for a gain of six. He could not ask for a better start for Vanderbilt. Yeah, that's huge, and just really a mental mistake by Queen on that side of the ball. He just read it wrong, hit the wrong gap, and that's all it takes when you have a dangerous running back like Keyshawn Vaughn. He's one of the best in the SEC. And Vanderbilt hasn't been able to blow the holes for him that they would like to, but if you give him an opportunity, he is as dangerous as it gets. Vandy's offensive line has struggled this season, and they've had to shuffle some guys around even coming into this one. On second and six, it's Vaughn again. 
And he makes his own hole after contact. A pickup of four. Grant Delpit came in from his safety spot along with Queen for the stop. Here's a look at the starters for Vandy on offense. The weapons, Lipscomb and Pinckney. Yeah, if you're Vanderbilt, I think you look on the outside. You don't love a ton of your matchups with the talent that LSU has, but you do like the matchup with Jared Pinckney on anybody. Just five receptions through two games. they got to find ways to get him the ball tonight, especially on important third downs. They go a little bit bigger. Pinckney and Ben Bresnahan on the field at the same time. And a pre-snap shift on third and two. Play clock almost ran out on him. Lipscomb open on the out route. It's a first down for Vanderbilt. Tracked by Derek Stingley Jr. That might be the first completion Stingley's allowed all season. And they took a page out of LSU's playbook. These tight splits create a lot of space on the outside. Lipscomb just attacks that leverage and has a lot of green grass on the outside. Good accurate throw by Riley Neal. And you're right, Stingley's a tough one. And remember, Dave Aranda was well aware that this is a Vandy team coming off the bye week. He said, we won't know what we're going to see until we see it. So it'll be a matter of reacting. Freshman running back Keon Brooks enters the game for Vanderbilt. Four-man rush into the end zone. Almost picked by Stingley. That'll be an interesting matchup all afternoon. Stingley and Lipscomb, if that's how it plays out. <laughs> Stingley almost got him back. This ball is just late. Riley Neal's got to let this go two or three steps earlier. Little late allowed Stingley to undercut the deep over route. If that's thrown earlier, that could be a touchdown because Kalijah Lipscomb had a step. I do like the aggressiveness, though, Tom. Vanderbilt gets inside the red zone or just outside the red zone. Take a shot. It's Neal who keeps it, and Neal bends it back inside the 10. When we watch film, the one thing we didn't see is Riley Neal keeping it on some zone reads. Yeah, and it's not his forte, but we were talking off to coordinator Jerry Godowski for Vanderbilt. He said, we have to do this early in the game, if only to keep LSU honest. And Braden Fajoko on the outside there got a little too far inside, so it was a great read by Riley Neal. They're not going to major in that, but just doing that now will slow down that backside pursuit. Vandy is only three of six in the red zone this season. They come in averaging only 15 points a game. A check from Riley Neal. Play clock is at two. Here's Vaughn. Vaughn sheds one. Stiff arms and other. And Vaughn gets tripped up as he makes his way to the five with a pickup of five. Christian Fulton finally brought him down. One of the best in the country at gaining yards after contact coming into this game 97 of his 130 yards on the season after contact the first guy never brings him down but good job by Jacoby Stevens there and neither did the second Vaughn already three carries for 50 yards in this game Neil Hands it off this time, and Vaughn will carry some dudes with him all the way to the goal line. And he's in. Touchdown, Vanderbilt. And the extra effort from the fifth-year senior, Keyshawn Vaughn, has Vandy on the board first. This is a great effort by Keyshawn Vaughn, but also a great effort by Vanderbilt offensive linemen getting behind Keyshawn and pushing him into the end zone there. Grant Miller, Sage Young, the center and left guard. Helping out big time with that late push. Senior Riley Gay on for the point after. Opening drive, a success for Vanderbilt. And they cover 75 yards in just eight plays. Their fifth-year senior, a Nashville native by way of the University of Illinois, Keyshawn Vaughn, able to carry the ball and some purple jerseys into the end zone. Really got the momentum going the right direction for Vandy. Good third down pickup with Neal to Elijah Lipscomb. And then this is what Vandy needs to do all day. Pound the rock. Wear down this LSU team if they can. 
But what a hot start. I mean, if there's anything that Derek Mason could have wanted from the start of this game, it was to get on the board quick. Glad Edwards Hilaire and Leonard Fournette back to return. This is Hilaire, and he will take it in the end zone. And that will bring out the most proficient passing offense in college football, led by the most accurate passer in college football. And it's a surprise even today to say that about an LSU quarterback. He grew up a Nebraska fan. Dad, a longtime coach there, and started his golden boy career at Ohio State under Urban Meyer. Dad Jimmy, coach with Derek Mason at Ohio. He's somewhere in the stadium today. I'm sure we'll see him shortly. By the looks of it, an Eminem fan back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Burrow facing pressure. Gets it off complete on a slant to Jamar Chase. Chase still on his feet. And finally thrown down for a gain of 20. So I asked you before the game, what can Vanderbilt do differently than what they've done this season? they got to bring pressure. If you watch the first quarter of that game against Texas, Texas had some success with late and delayed blitzes getting after Joe Burrow. If you sit back and give him space, he'll do just what he did last play. Here's Edward Zolaire with a big gain. He's down the numbers and finally tracked down from behind. Oh, Dangbo with the tackle after a 47-yard run. Two plays, 91 yards for LSU. Oh, there's a breath of fresh air for LSU fans. As much as you love lighting it up through the air, love to see the running game get going early. And so Vanderbilt brings pressure. It seems they will be exposed. Can they limit that exposure? Will help determine the outcome of this one. One of the nation's best offenses on a roll early. Here's a layer, and he couldn't grab it. He would have had six. He was right in front of him. Again, just a great job up front by LSU, sealing off the movement by Vandy. And I guarantee Edwards Alaire has been waiting for a hole like that. And so Ogeron said offensively, we just need to do simple better when it comes to the run game. That one went for 46. A check to the sideline. Play relayed from the booth. Alaire again. And inside the five. The question is, can this LSU team be elite and compete for a national championship if they don't establish the run game? I think to some degree you have to, and that's what Ed Orgeron was talking about. We're not a good spread zone run team right now. As you see, no running back in the backfield. And a touchdown catch by Justin Jefferson. Quick tempo that time. That is the problem. If you're Jason Tarver, the defensive coordinator for Vanderbilt, you got to be careful when you substitute. They were late running a different personnel package on the field there. LSU saw it. They went tempo. And Vandy was never ready. And a great snag here on a little bit of an inside throw by Joe Burrow. But the tempo is what did that one. Cade York on for the point after. It took him a minute 13 and just five plays to get down the field. Each team has one, had one crack at it, and each team has put one on the board. Get ready for a shootout on the West End. 7-7 seven, seven early. LSU offense, which comes in third in the nation and scoring at 55 points a game. Justice Shelton Mosley back to receive this kick from Avery Atkins, a sophomore from Auburn. No chance to return this one. Let's return it to the studio as we say hello to our good buddy, Peter Burns. Thank you, Zabba's Hart. Uh, studio update. Let's go down to T-Town where, sh stop me if you've heard this before, Alabama first drive. Henry Ruggs, it's not fair. 7-0. They lead Southern Miss right now in Tuscaloosa. And on the first drive, it was Kyle to Kyle. Kyle Trask finds Kyle Pitts for the touchdown. 7-0, although Tennessee just got a fumble back to Music City. I can hear the South Park highlights right now with Kyle playing a key role. Second possession for Vanderbilt. Riley Neal hands it off. And a grind on the right side will pick up four before Michael Divinity makes a stop. Cole, you talked about Michael Divinity playing a new position today for LSU. How big a move is that for this unit? 
Well, I think when, you, when you're looking at third and longs, it's a big move because he can. he's the second-best pass rusher on the football team, and we haven't seen 18 Caleb on chase on back out there yet. But Jordan pointed out some missed assignments by the inside linebackers early in this game that led to big runs. That's where Divinity would have been. You catch that Cajun inflection on Chase on from Cole. <laughs> Chase on. Second down seven. Vaughn is split out to the top of the screen. Five wide here for Vandy. In a three man rush. And they chase him. And Neal will throw it away. Good sign if you're Dave Aranda. They've had a hard time getting any pressure with a four man rush. Yeah, and that's one thing he was worried about coming into this game. How much would they see what Northwestern State and Texas did a little bit of with the shifts, the motions, the empty sets? And you see right there, nose guard Tyler Shelvin working on center Grant Miller providing the pressure. If they can get a pressure with three of their big guys in there, not even their pass rush personnel, it's a really good sign. But right now you'll see this defensive front for LSU. It's called their peso set. All their lean, mean pass rushers on the line of scrimmage. And they walk Patrick Queen up. Into the A-gap. He'll come eventually. Neal lets it go. Bat it away, and it falls incomplete. Grant Delpit, preseason All-American. Todd McShay has him at number three on his preseason draft board. And this is what makes this kid so good. I mean, best part of his game may be blitzing the quarterback, coming down around the line of scrimmage, but in coverage, look at this turnaround. I mean, how quickly did he transition from the top of that, planting a foot and getting downhill to break that up against a big physical tight end in Jared Pink? Harrison Smith, the sophomore from Brentwood Academy in Franklin, Tennessee, to punt it away. Freshman Derek Stingley Jr. stands at his own 27. LSU returned one for a score last week. Stingley takes it and gets taken down. Was looking for an opportunity, never developed. 37-yard punt, one on return. Brendan Harris with a special team stop for Vandy. Back to Nashville after this. Yeah, I bet they wish they were in that offense. Take a look at what they were doing back in 2013. 251 yards a game and 36 points. Uh, a little bit more prolific now under what Joe Brady's doing as a pass game coordinator. I mean, they got some good receivers here at LSU now, but imagine if Odell had Burrow in this Whoa. offense. Yeah. Yikes. Tyron Davis Price, a freshman running back, is split out among five wide. Jefferson and Terrace Marshall each have five touchdowns. First pair of SEC teammates over the last 20 seasons with at least five touchdowns in the team's first four games to the air again. And this is Jamar Chase. He's in a chase. And he will take it all the way. One play, 6.64 yards. LSU looks unstoppable. Wow. What's the common thread of LSU's offense, especially throwing the football so far this year, attacking the middle of the field? They're doing it better than any team in the country. And again, catch Vanderbilt in a soft, too high zone. And Chase just splits them. Another point after for Cade York. Freshman from McKinney, Texas. Was the SEC Special Teams Player of the Week two weeks ago. And LSU's establishing win against Texas. It may not be the high water mark of the season for the Tigers. I'll tell you what. This LSU defense is probably sitting on the bench over there going, wait, wait a minute. We, just we need left. a breather. What is going on here? Look at this. Soft cover two zone there. Chase just splits it. We had a long talk with Jason Tarver yesterday about picking up your receivers in a zone, handing them off. It's something that in the, in the NFL, it's relatively easy. Without a lot of meeting time in the college game, it gets a lot harder, especially the way Joe Burrow can pick you apart with levels. Yeah, and right there, if you're the inside linebacker to that side, you know, okay, we got too high, so where's the weakness? Middle of the field. If your slot receiver goes vertical and that outside guy doesn't attack you, you got to keep getting vertical to close that window off so Burrow doesn't have that easy of a throw in such a big hole. Well, this is what LSU ranks in the SEC. <laughs> and today, two I mean, possessions, six plays, 139 yards, two touchdowns, time of possession, a minute 24. And I tell you what, Vanderbilt right now not doing anything different. I haven't seen the pressure. I haven't seen the blitzes. I don't know if that score in their first drive said, hey, let's maybe we can slow play this. We don't have to be as aggressive, but it's not working right now. 14 to 7 here. PB, what else is going on in the SEC? 
How about this? The rare Pac-12 team rolling into Oxford. They were at City Grocery last night. Matt Corral gets it in. First and goal. Touchdown 7-7. Now back to the boys in Nashville. That's a 9 a.m. start for the Golden Bears. Might be rubbing some sand out of their eyes this morning. That's early, and I tell you what, I'm a Northern California boy. They don't know humidity like there is in Mississippi, so it's early and it's hot. Larry Scott all for that, though, right? Uh, yes, sure. Let's play as early as we can. Vandy keeps it on the ground, and no chance to escape the clutches of Braden Fajoko. Speaking of heat, coming up after us, 4 Eastern, 3 Central. Kentucky goes to Starkville. Severe heat warnings in Starkville today. They're handing out water to try and stay fresh. The SEC Network alternate channel will have South Carolina Mizzou at 4 Eastern, 3 Central. And to find the SEC Network alternate channel in your area, go to secnetwork.com. It feels like a must-win game for both of those conference games, whether you're Kentucky, Mississippi State, Missouri, or South Carolina. Oh, especially if you're Mississippi State and Joe Moorhead, they got to get things going in the right direction. Neal keeps it again. Makes the first man miss. Riley Neal put the move on Andre Anthony. It's a gain of four. And a great read earlier in the game by Riley Neal. But this time, you're reading this guy right here. What does he do? Look at him. He slow plays this. you got to hand that one off. You only pull it if it's absolutely clear cut, especially when you're not really a mobile guy or a guy that's going to break one in Riley Neal. Not a great read on that one. He's got Keyshawn Vaughn in the backfield again. Vaughn averaging nine yards a carry so far today. <laughs> Pressure. And Neal able to get it out of the backfield to Vaughn. It turns into just a gain of two. The screen game for Vandy was so good last year under offensive coordinator Andy Ludwig. Is that something that could benefit them today against LSU's defense? It absolutely could, but, but we're not seeing the same things in this offense that we saw under Ludwig. The shifts, the motions. We've seen a little bit more this week, but that's what made them so good at the screens. They had an exotic look that they could get to for a number of different screens. Camden Coleman is on the field for this Vanderbilt punt team. This is significant because this is the first organized game Coleman has ever played in. Fair catch taken last minute. Pretty cool story on Camden Coleman, guys. He came to a walk-on tryout here at Vanderbilt, actually ends up making the team. He ran track and played basketball at University Laboratory in Champaign, Illinois. Both of his parents are opera singers. Did not play a down of organized football in high school or college before this game today. Coach Tarver told us he is a 100 mile per hour guy every single snap in practice. I talked to Devin Fitzsimmons, the special teams coach before the game. He said he won that job in the bye week. We could not keep him out. I mean, that is amazing. You show up, by the way, the first down of organized football you ever play against number four LSU. Ooh. Things are moving fast for him, but I bet he's having a blast. Pocket pressure on Burrow. Gets rid of it for a first down. Plenty more. Terrace Marshall across midfield and into Vandy territory. And everything Joe Burrow has touched and everything that's been called by Joe Brady or Steve Ensminger has turned to purple and gold. Watch Joe Burrow navigate this pocket. Steps up and moves better than any quarterback I've watched this year. Finding space, creating a throwing lane for a big play. LSU's receivers wide open. Vandy can't tackle. Going to be a long day back there. That's Terrace Marshall for 20. That last play, very reminiscent of that Texas third and 17 where Burrow navigated the pocket, made a throw off balance. Didn't see much of that last year. He's doing that at such a high level, and it's not part of his game that we got to see last year. Fifth play of 20 yards or more. Looking for the six. Caught falling backwards with a flag on it and a fantastic grab to set up the first down. I think that one's coming back. I think they're going to get OPI, a little pass interference. Racy McCath got a little racy on us. Ken Williamson is our referee. Look how deep LSU's going into the roster. Play. Pass interference, defense number 17. Personal foul, rough on the passer, defense number 14. He meant offense number 17, defense number 14. This is too bad. He doesn't even really need to do this. The ball is thrown so well. It's not egregious, but if you extend the arm in any movement by the cornerback, Correction, 
Pass interference, offense number 17. Personal foul roughing the passer, defense number 10. First foul's offset. Replay the down. So McGrath and Odangbo, the ones who got flagged. Racy McGrath, uh, McMath just came out of nowhere. I mean, they've got three legitimate wide receivers, and you had two great tight ends. You had McMath, you had John Trey Kirkland. And then a 6'3", 221-pound guy on the outside that can make catches like that. Oh, just add that to the mix. They've got Stephon Sullivan in as a tight end right now. Trying to run behind him. Clyde Edwards, Alaire, takes it to the five. We're talking with Ed Ogeron yesterday, and we asked him, do you need to run the ball better, or do you accept it given what you're doing through the air? And he said, well, we need to run the ball better. We can do that by simplifying things. He said, but then again, every time I try to get on somebody about our run game, I look up and we've thrown for another 40 yards. <laughs> it's so true. They're not able to practice it as much as they're used to because they're so good at pushing the ball downfield. That's what everyone wants to do. Andy bringing pressure. All of it. And a go to the slant for a completion of McMath. And might be just shy. This could be third and short coming up. LSU quickly on the ball. Third and inches. Burrow gives it up. Alaire's got the first down. He's got the touchdown. From nine yards out. What took him so long? That time, nearly two minutes to cover 67 yards. Plays like that are going to be so underrated, but this is Joe Brady at work. They come out in a second down with three or four wide receivers, one tight end in the game, get into a third and short, and instead of changing personnel, they go to the tempo, bring everybody to the line of scrimmage, and hand it off real quick before Vandy can get any big guys on the field. Cade York's been busy this first quarter. Third point after is good. One up by land, two up by air, 21 on the offense for LSU. Alabama to see who can burn the most bulbs in the scoreboard today. Both those. Is it he has lanes? I mean, how much yak do both these teams get? It's unbelievable. It'll be interesting once we get to that point to measure LSU's wide receivers versus Alabama's wide receivers. Riley Neal delivers a strike to Kalijah Lipscomb. He makes Stingley miss, and he takes it to the 40-yard line. Vanderbilt trying to hang with firepower. It's a 35-yard play. And when we had Riley Neal week one, I don't think he stands in here and makes this type of throw because he has Kalijah Lipscomb. Great route, great leverage, and with guys in his face, Riley Neal delivered a strike there. When we had him week one, there was half. that time Andre Anthony comes up to make the stop Cole we haven't seen Caleb on chase on just yet what did he tell you about his desire to play today well, I talked to him before the game he said I'm asking coach O if I can go I want to play and I talked to him earlier this week as well he said I feel good I'm obviously not 100 percent coach Ordron told us in meetings he is available if needed have not seen him yet K. McClendon moved over to the defensive side of the ball. We we'll see him most likely in goal line situations. Neal to the perimeter. This is Pinkney. The come down. And with no K. Looking to find a guy. Who's going to be the guy that can rush the passer similar to the way Caleb on chase on can and does when he's healthy. Is it going to be Michael Divinity moving outside to outside linebacker having opportunities Andre Anthony as well. Dave Aranda the defensive coordinator for LSU still trying to figure out the identity of his unit four man rush here. Neil flushed. Tyler Shelvin 
brought him down and now it looks like he's going to be just inches short fourth and a foot to go gotta you got to go. go for gotta it gotta right? go because if you give it back you're giving up seven the other way would love to see some tempo here by Vandy as well similar to what LSU LSU did last drive Vandy one of three on fourth down this season Neil under center trying to sneak it and a whistle before the snap occurred. Thomas Eaton, the headlinesman, saw something. Ken Williamson will discuss it with him, and they'll give Derek Mason an option. Vanderbilt has taken a timeout to challenge the ruling on the field of the spot that was short of the line again. Wait a second. That was a really quick whistle. Yeah, it was. Oh, so they were looking at the previous yes. play. My bad. My bad. I think that's a good call. I mean, just from up here, obviously, it looked like Riley Neal got it. And you even said it at first. So I'd be interested to see a close shot here. His knee went down sooner than we thought, but looked like they might have spotted him about a half yard short. And in that case, it would be a first down. And the spot came from the far sideline as Neal was up that far hash mark. Riley Neal had a big game in high school for... Yorktown High School against West Lafayette where he carried the ball 40 times in one game. We joked with him about it yesterday. Remember the yellow line unofficial. He's got to get if he gets to the 29. It's a first down knee is down. Where's the ball? Ah, see yeah knee came down a little shorter than it looked like live. So I think that's actually a really good spot. Here's our yard to gain camera knee down. Yep. It might be just over that 30 yard line, but I think it's still short. So if you're Jerry Godowski, the offensive coordinator in his first season as the OC for Vanda, you've had time to think about a fourth and short play if you don't get the first down. I think they come right back to QB sneak. I mean, if you look at the metrics of that play, both at the NFL level and college, it is successful. But as the quarterback, you saw Riley Neal in that last one. He didn't have his feet under. You got to get your feet almost like a sprinter stance if you're a quarterback well behind you so you can get all your momentum in a big push. So my second question is if Vandy has to take chances to win this game on fourth and inches you've shown quarterback sneak would this After be a play review, we could take a shot really on the field stands. Additionally the replay booth was attempting to contact the crew prior to the challenge. Therefore Vanderbilt will not be charged with a timeout nor the challenge. I mean you you got to take chances to win this game if you're Vanderbilt. I agree Tom but. You know, maybe it's like the reverse psychology thing. Oh, we just saw him do QB sneak. They won't go back to it, right? And then you do go <laughs> yeah. back to it. I just think right here you got to do something that's high percentage. I would be very careful taking a shot. If it was me, I'd come back to that quarterback sneak. They had time to discuss it. They come out of the huddle. And Riley Neal once again will go under center. He's got a power back. Keyshawn Vaughn behind him. Fourth and inches. It's not going to be a sneak. Here's Vaughn. Bounces to the outside. Hit behind the line, and he will not get there. Jacob Phillips and Christian Fulton with the stop. How'd you know one going to be a sneak? Well, you, you could tell by Riley Neal's feet that he wasn't gearing up to sneak it. And I think they had the A gap to the left of the center wide open. Instead, they handed off to Keyshawn Vaughn. Not a bad choice. He's your best player. But LSU, a great job of rallying to the ball. First one never gets him, so a great job there by Patrick Queen rallying and getting Vaughn down behind the line. Pretty good look there and why Dave Miranda said Christian Fulton might be playing some more nickel in the future. He has those kind of instincts to come up and help with the tackle behind the play. They lost Todd Harris to injury last week. They're looking for more bodies in the secondary. And here they come back on offense. Sadiq Charles started this game at left tackle. He's in there now. Thaddeus Moss back to action this week after sitting out last week. Timeout, LSU, first timeout this half. This will be a 30-second timeout. 2.06 remaining in the first quarter. LSU has averaged less than two minutes per drive each of their first three drives, and they've all ended in touchdowns. One of the ideas from LSU offensively and Steve Ensminger's They've had an extra week to prepare, just like Aranda on the defensive side. It might take us a minute to see 
what we're seeing and we'll get checks and calls into Joe Burrow it, it seems like that has not been much of a roadblock no not at all and I think we we thought we might see more lookovers but LSU's been able to use tempo early and it's been successful look at this fourth down Tom I mentioned there might be an area you can go here or here with the QB sneak you're telling me that Riley Neal at 6 6 couldn't get a half a yard there that's why I really thought they'd come back to it. If LSU doesn't score on this play, I have a follow-up question. That's a big if. Edward Zelaire in the backfield. A look over by LSU. They like the play. They'll keep it on. Burrow to the outside. It's another first down. It's Terrace Marshall Jr. In that scenario, does Riley Neal, a veteran quarterback, have the ability to check to a sneak or just take it himself or no? <laughs> Not necessarily. Back in the day in junior college, I had one we called a peanut butter cups. Of course, I had a 400 pound center. So and what was his nickname? His nickname was peanut butter. Cups. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so he's just like, hey, if you ever want to sneak, just tap me and say peanut butter cups. It'll just be you and me. <laughs> so I'm not sure if Riley has that opportunity, but if he did, he missed a big one there because I think they picked that up if they sneak it. Only in junior college would the center be nicknamed <laughs> Peanut Butter Cups. And 400 pounds. Yeah, Jamar Chase lost his helmet, lost the defender. Play will be dead where the helmet came off. It's like 50 first dates. You know the guy in the kitchen? <laughs> hey, Peanut Butter Cups. That's where it came from. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to know any more of your junior college stories. Save it for the feature film. <laughs> Marshall, a part of me, Chase will have to come out for a play after losing the helmet. The question was it ripped Personal off. Personal foul. It was. Defense number 16. 15-yard penalty, pin to the run, automatic first down. B.J. Anderson, sophomore defensive back. Additionally, number one can stay in the game as his helmet came off as a result of a hell. helmet foul. Yeah, Tom, ripping a guy's helmet off, usually frowned upon. <laughs> De depending. <laughs> right. You can get away with that in junior college. Oh, yeah. So the helmets are Velcro. At least our chin straps were. Didn't John have the, didn't have the money for normal ones. <laughs> John Emery, Jr., he is in the game at running back, third different running back that LSU has used here in the first quarter. Pressure coming from the edge. Burrow goes that direction. And he completes it for another big game. This is Terrace Marshall Jr. Leading the country in touchdown receptions with six. Vanderbilt now kind of stepping away from bringing the pressure that we saw a few times early in this game. They're playing a lot more zone. This time looks like now they might be coming back to it, man across the board, and one high. LSU averaging 17 yards per play. Add to that with this touchdown catch from Jamar Chase. It goes for 25. It's just too easy right now for Joe Burrow in this LSU offense. Too many playmakers. And like I said, Vandy, a lot of zone on that drive. As soon as they get into man, what do you do? Go to your playmaker on the outside and one-on-one -on -one in LSU right now. They're winning every one of those battles. Chase already 113 yards receiving. Two touchdowns. Did he have control when that left foot came down? I think he already had it when the step before it looked pretty clear to me. You remember the push off on the other side of the field a couple drives ago? Yep. Chase got away with a little bit of movement there, but never extended the arm. If you don't extend that arm, a lot of times it's not getting called. What do you think Les Miles is thinking looking at all the points that LSU's putting up this season? He's thinking, man, I should have found Joe Brady when he was, what, 17? <laughs> yeah, he would have been a little bit younger. <laughs> 28 points is tied for the most in the first quarter in LSU history. They did it against La Tech in 03. And Tulane in 1965. It is their most ever in the first quarter against an SEC opponent. Joe Burrow's thrown for 199 and three touchdowns. Academy Sports and Outdoors is making it even easier on you with in-store pickup. It's all new and basically means you go to academy.com, order whatever you need, and come get it in-store. Get in, get out, get back to having fun with your family. So you mentioned Joe Brady. He is the architect of this passing game. He spoke to the LSU coaching staff a couple of years ago during a coaching clinic. When he left the room, Ed Ogeron said, who was he? Let's try to hire that guy. They did. Burrow with the hand on the brow in the middle of your screen. Steve Ensminger, the offensive coordinator on the right side of your screen. He is just 29 years old. 
He was a former walk on wide receiver at William and Mary. Spent some time with Joe Moorhead at Penn State. And the last couple of years been working with a guy by the name of Drew Brees is pretty good in his passing game too. And it'd be fascinating to stand right behind those two during the game because the play calling responsibilities are very shared. They go back and forth, bounce ideas off each other, very much a collaboration the entire game. And really a collaboration to get Joe Brady here. Coach O mentioned he sat down with Insminger and said, I want to go get the best talent I can to help out this offense and help you out. And Insminger said, let's do it. Talk with Ed Ogeron about it. He said, Joe Brady comes to work every day. The players love him. He is a grinder. He said, every time I walk by his office, he's got his big silver headphones on. He's watching film. He's dialing it front, dialing it back. Simple wave between the two. And Ogeron said, I just keep walking. Let the guy do his work. LSU is on pace for a historic day here. Last year they set an SEC single game record for points with 72 in seven overtimes against AM. Without overtime, 63 against Kentucky. Saturdays in the South is our eight part documentary that chronicles the history of SEC football. Tuesday at 9 Eastern, part four takes you into the 1970s for a look at Bear Bryant's recommitment to the wishbone plus the role sports on TV played in the SEC, led by the voice of college football, Keith Jackson. You can only see Saturdays in the South right here on the SEC Network and the ESPN app. 63 points against Kentucky in 97. The SEC high for a non-overtime game for LSU. This is Jared Pinckney. And Pinckney takes it for eight. And this is what you got to do if you're Vanderbilt's offense with Jared Godowski calling plays. You got to find ways to get Jared Pinckney the ball. See what they do here? He's tight to the line of scrimmage. Jacoby Stevens, number three, is man to man, but he's got two receivers he's got to go through. So it gives a little space for Pinckney, finding creative ways to get him the ball. He's going to be a draft pick next year and probably a pretty high one in the first few rounds. He is a studious tight end. He watches all of the old school greats. YouTube's his best friend in that regard. Back to the running game, and LSU snuffs it out. Neil Farrell Jr. It's a loss of one. Through one quarter, LSU has put up 100, uh, pardon me, 261 yards. They're averaging 17 and a half yards per play, 20 yards per completion, and they lead Vanderbilt. 28 to 7. LSU keeping the offense rolling here on Nashville's West End. It's time for the most points in the first quarter in school history as we welcome back to SEC football presented by Allstate. LSU fans made the trip. One of the best sports towns in the country, and they have been rewarded so far. Third and three for Vanderbilt. Keyshawn Vaughn is the running back. Blitz up the middle. Out to the outside. It's a first down for Kalijah Lipscomb. He's out of New Orleans Jesuit. He's got a great tight end with him this year, and Jared Pinkney. He had a great one at Jesuit. Foster Morrow, the former LSU tight end who's now in the NFL. And coming into this game, just one reception on third down after last year having an SEC best 27. Exact same play. They ran for a third down conversion on their first drive. LSU this year so far has struggled with some of those tight and condensed formations, which is surprising because that's what they do on offense yeah, now. They see it every day. Neil looking for time, backpedals, and lobs it down the field, and it's dropped. Pinckney was waiting for it, and Jacoby Stevens came in to separate him from the football. It's a long developing play that Vanderbilt offensive line has to block for a long time. And Riley Neal just not able to put enough zip on that ball as he was backing away from the pass rush. So it took a little long to get there. Obviously one that needs to be pulled down. But Pinkney had quite a few yards there of space. Ball just took too long. LSU shows pressure from the edge. Out to Shelton Mosley, and the Harvard transfer has his first play of the day. It's a gain of nine. He was an FCS All-America two years ago at Harvard as a returner. 
And three career punt return touchdowns. All with the Crimson. And is working on his Masters in Marketing here. This time it's Cam Johnson. He gets past the first. Takes it inside the 30. 28 yard gain for the freshman from Brentwood, Cam Johnson. And chalk that play up to tempo. Vandy was quick to the offensive line. Nice, easy throw. And Kerry Vincent was trying to get lined up, so he was late, took a bad angle. Results in a big play. Two tight ends in the game now for Vanderbilt. Bresnahan and Pinckney. Neal fires sideline. Broken up by Derek Stingley Jr. Week one, Stingley became the 10th True freshman to start the season opener on defense in LSU history. And he's just so talented. Locked in on man coverage, gets his eyes around really early, so sees that back shoulder throw coming from a mile away. To be that young and have those kind of instincts this early, he's going to be special. And he's still learning the game, according to Dave Aranda. Movement. Flag down. Free play. And it will fall incomplete. Neil Farrell Jr., who had brought pressure earlier, jumped, and we got a second flag down in the secondary. And that's a great job by Vanderbilt of keeping this play alive. You go from a five yard penalty for false start now to a pass interference call as Riley Neal has a free play and tries to get it to Pinkney down the field. It's another area that tempo helps you out as well, Jordan. You go fast, fast, fast. That defensive line comes up to the line of scrimmage. They expect that football to be snapped right away. Yeah, you throw a little double count in there. Keep the play alive, and it's a freebie. Offside, defense number 92. That penalty will be declined. Holding, defense number 49. That penalty will be accepted. 10 yards, automatic first down. Wow, and they call it a holding. It definitely was. And then Jacoby Stevens going to be manned up with Jared Pinkney. He just bear hugs him here at the top of his stem, trying to run a corner route. Yep, nope. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Trevez Moore had a busted coverage last week in the Northwestern State game that led to a touchdown. <laughs> Bootleg, Neal, and he threw it to a cheerleader on his way out of bounds. To be fair, the cheerleader was open. Yeah, she's got to get her head around, you know, be expecting that one. Quarterback gets outside the pocket, you got to be ready for anything. You need to put her on the jugs gun, maybe? <laughs> get some reps for these LSU cheerleaders? Tell you what, it's hot out there. Yeah. And you can tell, look at these LSU guys, hands on the hips. I mean, the heat and the tempo are definitely getting to them. So right. I like the call there, getting Riley outside the pocket. Not stopping the cheerleaders. No, they're rolling. They're well hydrated. Second down, 10. Neal, end zone shot. Stingley with the coverage. Was that caught? Wow. Kalijah Lipscomb looked like he hauled it in, but may have been out of bounds. But what incredible concentration to haul that in through Stingley. I didn't think there was any way this ball was getting to Lipscomb's hands. And you know what? I think we got to take a look at that one. Well, it certainly wasn't controlled at the outset. And was he still in bounds when he came down? But I, yeah, that's going to be the tough part. Yeah. yeah. By the time it hits his. Early on the field was an incomplete pass. The previous play is under review. I don't know, right knee and right elbow. That sh that angle shows us that's the side of the body that came down first. Probably. Or was it control? Exactly. And his arm is under it, but the nose of the ball does touch the turf as well. And I'm not sure he had enough control before that. Let's see here. Ball's ricocheting around. His right arm's going to come underneath it. We've got Matt Austin back in our Charlotte studios, longtime SEC official. Matt, what do you see when you watch these replays? 
Well, this is going to be a tough one since the ruling on the field was an incomplete pass. I'm not sure there's inconclusive evidence to overturn it to a touchdown. It does look like he might control it at the very end, but you can't go on might. So this one's going to be uh, this one's going to be tough. And see, I think that's the angle right there from behind is is yes, his arm is under it, but he doesn't have control by the time it hits his arm and then touches the ground. After further review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. Incomplete pass. It's third down. I think that's the right call. Great effort by Kalijah Lipscomb on the outside, but just didn't have control, and the ground aids him in the catch here towards the end. Kalijah Lipscomb is still without a touchdown this season. First team preseason All-SEC wide receiver. Came in on the Blitnikoff list as the best wide receiver in college football. This will be the tenth play of the drive for Vanderbilt. A lot of movement for LSU pre-snap. Neal steps up in the pocket, gets pressured, and gets taken down. An LSU sack. Those have been a rarity this season. A loss of six. It belongs to Justin Thomas. And Riley Neal's just got to get rid of the ball here. Once you climb up in the pocket, you get to the top, you can't go backwards at that point. You either got to run and keep going forward, or you got to let that ball go and take a shot towards the back of the end zone. Ninth sack of the season for LSU. First today. Riley Gay on for a 41-yarder. Scott Meyer, the long snapper. Harrison Smith holds. And that one is good. So Vanderbilt able to eat some clock in 11 play, 52 yard drive for 28 10 here, PB. Boy, who's going to put up better numbers today? Tua or Burrow? I think it's going to come down to who stays in the game the longest. LSU fans feeling right at home, by the way. Oh, yeah. Probably a little slow start for them, too. They probably had some fun on Broadway last night. They may have. They're smooth, though. Let's take a look at the smoothest play brought to you by Velveeta. I mean, right now, Vanderbilt has no answer for Jamar Chase. Burrow has found him multiple times with room and green grass to run, and he has made Vanderbilt pay and making big plays in one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside as well. I tell you what, Alabama's receivers look good, but I'm not so sure you can count this LSU group out of the conversation on the most talented in the conference, and maybe even the country. Well, LSU's got a measuring stick, right? I mean, Alabama's wide receiving core came in with all the headlines and heralded and deservedly so. Leonard Fournette is in at running back. Burrow looking to add to the numbers. That is complete at the stick. Cole, how would you break it down? LSU's receivers versus Bama's. I think Alabama's receivers have a little more getaway, a little more juice once they get to full stride, but they don't have the big bodies, the physical receivers that LSU does. I think that would be the difference for me. Alabama's maybe hurts you a little bit more straight ahead. LSU's could do more in traffic. Fresh set of downs for Joe Burrow. LSU averaging 17 yards a play. Burrow gives it up to Fournette. It's a gain of one. Leonard's brother Leonard was the workhorse Thursday night for Jacksonville. But he got caught from behind on one run. Don't see that very often. I guess that's what happens when you're the only running back in the offense. <laughs> yeah, you get tired eventually. Oh, he's still running a 4-4-8. Yeah, after 30 carries. On second and nine, twist up front. O-line picks it up. Burrow's got all day, but nobody's open. Little ad-lib action. Here's Sullivan. First down, LSU. Drew that one up in the dirt, and it goes for 28. I mean, great play by Burrow, but watch this block by Adrian McGee. On Dio Dangbo coming on a stunt. Watch this. 73 up. Nope. <laughs> Not today, baby. Wow. Oh, and then he goes, wait, maybe I should keep blocking. Joe Burrow still got the ball. <laughs> Back to action, and uh, Vandy gets penetration to take down Burrow. 
Seven plays of 20 yards or more already for this LSU offense. Pass pro is not passive, fellas. I mean, can we see that again? That was unbelievable. Well, Dangbo is Vanderbilt's best pass rusher, too, and he's no small cat, 6'6", 275, and he got absolutely pancaked. Play after that, Vandy picked up its very first sack of the year. That came from Jalen Mahoney. LSU is going to use the timeout here. Timeout. LSU, second timeout of the half. This is Cole Kublik's dream. Cole, you love O-line play. How about a pancake and a blitzing to So keep an eye on that if you're an LSU fan moving forward. The Vandy coaches, Derek Mason and Jerry Godowski, the OC, were both on Jimmy Burrow, the same staff with Jimmy Burrow at Ohio. They've known Joe for years, and they said this guy simply doesn't lose. He is a competitor. You wonder how long you stick with him to try to avoid more injury. Sullivan catches the tip pass, and that'll go for six. They said, look, Joe Burrow used to run around the field at Ohio, and as a matter of fact, they had one of the older ball boys. He was in charge of filming the youth league games that Joe Burrow was playing in. And Godowski, there's Dad Jimmy. Godowski and Mason all joined together with Jimmy Burrow on Frank Solich's staff with the Ohio Bobcats after Solich was out of the game for a year following his dismissal from Nebraska. Third 15 pressure. Burrow gets it out incomplete. And the Vandy pressure, they had a chance to tee off, and it results in the first three and out, or the first punt, I should say, for LSU. That's a great job by Vanderbilt bringing pressure. An empty backfield right there, so Burrow knew he had to get rid of it early. And you're going to see pressure coming up the middle here, getting in the face of Joe Burrow. He's got an outbreaking route, just has to let it go a little earlier than he would like, and that's why it was just a foot outside for Jamar Chase. Here's a former pitcher, Zach Van Rosenberg. Oldest player on the team at 28. And that one taken inside the 10, a 31-yard punt, perfectly placed by Von Rosenberg. So let's take you back to Ohio University where Derek Mason was coaching the wide receivers every day. He went against Jim Burrow, who was a defensive coordinator and coached the defensive backfield. And Jerry Godowski coached the quarterbacks. Mason said, I got to know Jim Burrow really well. He was a veteran coach at the time. He had been a long time assistant at Nebraska. He was helpful to me in my career because he knew some of the pitfalls that I should have been looking out for. Keon Brooks gets tripped up and finds just a yard. A lot of, um, a lot of webs and personal relationships throughout the game of college football. Interesting how the Burrow family ties into so many. Both of his brothers played at Nebraska. Interesting to hear Mason just say he, he could see it coming, too. Even just seeing Burrow at that young age, like, you knew he was going to be a player. You knew he'd know a lot about the game, and that's what makes him so tough to scheme against. You, you can't pull one over on him. He sees every blitz, every pressure. Trying to find room on the outside. And LSU strings it out. It's a gain of two. And you know what we're learning? LSU, other LSU parents are learning. Hey, you know what? Papa Burrow's going to be on TV. I'm going to sit near oh, him, yeah. get a wave to the camera, and I can get some TV time too. That's a Tom Hart move there. Yeah, you just, just slide in where you can. <laughs> no shortage of LSU fans, even though that guy's missing his shirt. Digging the look. Third down seven, it's Keyshawn Vaughn now in the backfield. Play clock at three. Blitz up the middle. Neal incomplete. Riley Neal ends up on the ground. 
Yeah, this is one of those looks Dave Aranda talked about. Creepers, he wants guys around the line of scrimmage, maybe not on the line of scrimmage, to bring that pressure so he drops Michael Divinity on that play. Patrick Queen comes from the linebacker position. They still have enough guys in coverage, and it's not truly a blitz, but it looks like pressure to the quarterback. It's almost like a zone blitz, right? It totally is, yeah. They drop a guy off, bring a guy, so really just replacing numbers. You're not adding extra guys but it speeds up the process for the quarterback and an errant throw there because of it. What a view for Harrison Smith. Stingley takes it at the 43. Guy might be a first to fair catches. It's a 46 yard punt. LSU's high powered offense will be back on the field. See if Joe Burrow can be steady. But they punted for the first time last time. They're covering a lot of ground and they don't need a whole lot of plays to do it. The only thing that kept them and kept their momentum from going last possession was the sack. But otherwise, Joe Burrow under the watchful eye of his pops. Both of his brothers are in town, too. And Dad's got a lot to like about this one. First time in 51 years he hasn't been on a football field in the fall. Either as a player or a coach. You know, he started his playing career at Ole Miss. Tyrion Davis Price, play action, Burrow over the middle. And that's good for a first down to Justin Jefferson. We had a great visit with Joe last week, and he talked about being a better fit for this offense. One of the things he didn't like, but what they used to run, was something he wasn't comfortable with, didn't have experience in. And that was a lot of the play action where he would turn his back to the line. That time he got crushed. Lobs it up, and it's a leaping catch goal for a first down with a flag to chase. And Burrow gets up with a flag in front of him. Wow, Joe Burrow just took a beating. Vandy brings pressure off the edge. There's a few guys. Caleb Pert in there as good as anybody. Watch the left and the right side. And somehow, kind of like the third down play against Jeez. Texas, he still had enough to push it downfield for a completion. Mm. Pass interference, defense number 28. That penalty will be declined. Personal foul, defense number 10. That penalty will be enforced into the run after distance to the goal, first down. LSU has a week off next week, but it still begs the question, up 28 to 10, how long do you leave Joe Burrow in this game? I'll tell you what. I wouldn't be surprised if this game keeps going that he doesn't play much, if any, got it, got it. in the second half. But then again, he's a competitor. I don't care what the score is. He's going to be tough to pull out of this game at any point. He wants to keep it rolling. Ref needs to turn his mic on. Yeah. There we go. There's one of those checks. Joe Brady and Steve Ensminger getting a look at the defense from the box, radioing the play down. Edward Zelaire. And the pile moves an extra yard or two. Gain of five. It's truly amazing. I think you want to look at the difference in LSU. Look right now. No, no big tight ends in the game. One tight end in the game there. And they're staying with tempo, staying with spread. I mean, this is just, this is new LSU. Movement. False start. Offense number 68. Five-yard penalty. Remains second down. Senior Damian Lewis. You know, it's truly an identity when you're up big and you're in the red zone and you don't change. You don't change the tempo. You don't change the personnel sets. This is who LSU is now. Get used to it. Mm. They're going to be tempo. They're going to have three, four wide receivers in the game when they do have a tight end. As you see Thaddeus Moss here at the bottom of your screen. Right here, they're going to use him. Davis Price is the running back now. Play clock at five. 
Burrow to the end zone. A wobbler, and it's incomplete. Moss, the intended receiver. Son of Pro Football Hall of Famer Randy Moss. And if he doesn't slip there, that's a touchdown. What I love about that play, LSU put three receivers to the top of your screen to the wide side, and they just decided to see how Vandy was going to adjust. Vandy sent an extra guy over there, so they stood up Thaddeus Moss, stepped him out a few steps, and let him go one-on-one. -on -one. If he doesn't slip, that's a touchdown. Pretty big, good pickup by center Lloyd Cushenberry there as well. Burrow 15 of 18 in this one. Third and goal. Burrow retreats. And it sticks it out of bounds and it gets intercepted. No, incomplete. Burrow went all the way to the wall by the Vandy bench. They whistled that thing dead at the 14-yard line. It is no return for Andre Mintz. And Burrow's going back over to check on one of the Vandy guys. Well, he's not checking nicely. He had something to say to Odangbo. Odangbo with a shove in the back and tight sidelines here carried Burrow past the net and into the wall. He did catch it in bounds, but he never reestablished himself. He stepped out of bounds. You see, and he jumps from out of bounds to in. Can't be the first Can't. one. Nope. You don't reestablish yourself, so should be no pick for Mintz. But how about the extracurriculars? Field, incomplete pass. Fourth down. How about not throwing that ball in the yeah. 30th row? Yeah, that, that, that's a mistake there for Joe Burrow. I mean, he's got to just launch that. And that's what we're always taught as quarterbacks. Sometimes you just lackadaisically toss it out of bounds. you got to throw that thing into the 10th row. Always be sure. He almost just kind of skyhooked yeah. that one. I mean, he grenaded it. There you go. 25-yard attempt for York. Derek Mason is still talking to the officials. And not in a real nice manner. They're going to get the side judge up to where he's supposed to be. Eric Mason is fighting and clawing for every inch. That could have been a momentum play for Vandy had Mintz been inbounds. From 25. And halfway up the stands. Joe Burrow took a shot late. Drew his ire. Mason not too happy either. He's got the Windex studio looking sharp today. Joe Burrow looking sharp, but also a little perturbed. And saw his competitive fire at the end of that last play. No return for Vandy. This is what transpired between Dale Odangbo and Joe Burrow after Burrow was shoved out of bounds. It looks like he's saying, hey, man, that was a really good hit. Really good job there. <laughs> Probably not what he said. That's great offensive line play by Sadiq Charles to be there yes. for your quarterback. Always. Bodyguards. But I, you know what? I love I love the fire of Joe Burrow. I love waving at the fans at Texas. I love having some words for guys after play. That one, that's what makes him. That's his DNA. I want him to be that all the time. And if you're LSU, you'd love to see it too. Keyshawn Vaughn, left side, is able to rip off another big run. It goes for seven. Keyshawn Vaughn on any other team in the SEC would be an All-American candidate. Absolutely. I mean, I, I very confidently, I think you can say, from a talent perspective, he's one of, if not the best in the SEC, but he's just behind an offensive line that, yes, has played a little better today than I think we saw in film, but they don't give him enough opportunities, enough holes to really capitalize on how good he is. They're starting Jonathan Stewart at left tackle today. Cole, when you watch the film, how impressed are you by Vaughn? Well, I, I, the thing that comes to my mind, Tom, is feature. And, and I don't feel like they feature him enough. He doesn't feel like a feature back when you study this offense on film. 
The guy's as durable as they come. He always seems to bounce off the first, second, and third tackles. He's never going down with one individual. But I would like to see him become the feature back in this offense, and that's going to open things up for Pinckney and Vaughn down the field. He had seven. Pinkney and Lipscomb, excuse me. Yeah, he had 17 carries against Purdue, only 56 yards. 15 carries against Georgia in the opener. And part of that's hard when you're playing from behind uh -huh. so much. Vaughn bottled up on the edge. Jacob Phillips the first there. It's a loss of a yard. Boy, what explosiveness by Phillips. Uh, we saw Patrick Queen miss really the hole early in the game on the big run by Vaughn. That time, Phillips read that and was there in a blink. That is not Ooh, a good sign. That's brutal. For LSU. That's the senior, Michael Divinity Jr. Jack Marucci and his athletic training staff quickly out to look at that left leg and the left ankle. I would I would dare to say he might be the most important player on the field for LSU. And even moving forward, his development with no Caleb on Chase on. Obviously, Chase on will be back, but they have to develop a pass rush. He's the next best guy on defense. Keep an eye out for 45 and purple on the left edge. Just gets kind of rolled up and over. There he is coming in on the tackle. Yeah, his leg, leg gets caught underneath him on the turf, rolls back over it. It's the versatility that Divinity brings to this defense, the ability to use him on the outside as a guy who can get to the quarterback. He had 10 tackles in a sack in the game against Texas. Had been moving inside and outside. And Caleb on chase on number 18 out there to check on his buddy, the senior from Marrero, Louisiana. So training staff still looking after Michael Divinity Jr. Let's take you back to the studio. Peter Burns. All right, thank you, gentlemen. 31 10 right now, LSU over Vanderbilt. Just real quick as we get ready to head back down there, what have you seen from the Tigers so far in Joe Burrow? Well, I mean, it's the same thing we've seen all year long just a lot of rhythm, accurate passing, and dangerous weapons in the, at the receiving core. They're able to continue to put pressure on opposing teams to match them score for score. And obviously, Vanderbilt doesn't have the same fire, firepower to match it. Yeah, and I think, you know, this different than last year. Last year, you saw a revolving door at the offensive line. They yep. were trying to plug guys in, guys were getting hurt. There was all kinds of you know, there, was, there wasn't any continuity. Now you're seeing continuity in an offensive line. Yes, the receivers are there. Yes, the, the Burrow thing is, is real. All right, but, let's uh, head it back up out to Nashville right now. Tom Hart and Jordan Rogers on the call after the Divinity injury. All right, Peter, thanks. And Michael Divinity being helped off the field, not putting any weight on the left leg. Once again, LSU has an off week next week. But this is a guy they cannot afford to lose. Already without Richard Lawrence and Glenn Logan on the defensive line today, as they have been the last couple of weeks. Second down, 11 for Vandy. Pressure, and it is batted down. What a push by Tyler Shelvin up front. The big dude, 6'3", 346 at a Lafayette. Jersey can barely hold him. <laughs> we've got, we've said his name a few times already today. I mean, for his size, he's got some he's got some jump to him. He's got a little bit of twitchiness. Working on a double team here. Look at that. Getting up off the ground, getting a hand up. It's a big body to get up and down like that. Look at that. He was a consensus number one player in the state, five-star recruit coming out of Notre Dame High School. Third and 11. Neal, too wide and incomplete. Kerry Vincent was on Chris Pierce, and Vandy will be forced to punt it away. Why with no Michael Divinity, a really clean pocket there for Riley Neal. He had time, pass rush, could not get there, but one of the reasons LSU is always so tough on defense, the ability to man up on the outside again comes in big. Got to win those one-on-one -on -one matchups if you're going to beat LSU or move the ball. And they haven't done that tonight, today. Used to be in a night. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> 
Low snap handled well. Stingley asks for a fair catch, lets it go. What a football sense. Turns into a 66 yard punt. We got pushing and shoving late, and a flag on the play. If that goes against LSU. Looks like it's going to be on Eric Monroe. I think Monroe got into it with the punter. During the kick, holding, receiving team number 14. 10 yard penalty from the end of the kick, first down. Busy day of football throughout the conference today and coming up after us for Eastern 3 Central. Kentucky goes into Starkville to take on Mississippi State. South Carolina, Missouri can be viewed on the SEC Network alternate channel. And then it's San Jose State, Arkansas in our SEC Saturday night matchup. To find the SEC Network alternate channel in your area, go to secnetwork.com. Joe Burrow still out there. He's joined by John Emery Jr. Here's Emery. It's like a pop at the end, but is able to pick up six. Joe Burrow, ice cold. He's missed on two straight. That's the first time he's done it in 76 attempts. Wow. To miss two in a row. That is unreal. <laughs> that's, that's how you lead the country in completion that's percentage. That's more impressive than any stat I've seen on Joe Burrow, period. 76 attempts? It's not a, two incomplete? Tony Gwynn's strikeout numbers couple more and that was set up a third and short Jordan what was he 15 of 16 against the blitz coming into this coming game? into this game 15 of 16 and just off the top of my head I don't think he's missed one against the blitz so far tonight today either on third down LSU keeps it on the ground and they'll move the chain slow to his feet is Justin Jefferson and the training staff quickly out to check on their wide receiver It's a hot one out here today, hopefully just a cramp. The Michael Divinity Jr., their starting linebacker, left with a lower leg injury. And they're working the left ankle of Jefferson. That's more than a cramp. Watch left side of your screen, number two in purple. Yep. And Jefferson will gingerly make his way back to the LSU sideline. Boy, you hate to see that. You love to see him get up and put weight on that walking off because two really important players to this LSU football team, both today and moving forward. And Michael Divinity going down earlier, and now Justin Jefferson. Jefferson second in the country in yards and yards per game. Burrow wants to throw. Complete to the edge. And Jamar Chase, a pickup of seven. Ball came out late. Tempo for LSU. What a move on the outside by John Emery Jr. Turns into a gain of seven. And we got action after this play was dead. We got a big Adrian McGee getting into it. About 15 yards away from the play with Dimitri Moore. Adrian McGee's a finisher. Dude can then lift 600 pounds. Lob shot deep and too much. Terrace Marshall, the intended receiver. After seeing what McGee did to Odangbo, Bandy's biggest, probably, guy on that side of the ball, I don't know if I'd mess with him. I think I'd pick on somebody else. Maybe a receiver. 
That's he just three. took Dimitri Moore for a ride about 15 yards down the field. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> That's one way you can pay him back as an O-lineman, huh? He outweighs Moore by 115 pounds. Two-man rush through Emery's hands. Good read there. Burrow wanted the slant. It wasn't there. Came off to the running back on his second option. Just a little hot for a true freshman out there. That ball's got to take a little bit off it for him, you know? Things are still moving a little fast for true freshmen early in this season. Valuable reps for those guys, though. They didn't see many in the Texas game a couple weeks ago. Third and ten. Five wide. They rush three. Spy Burrow and on the run. A crossing route complete for a first down. Stephon Sullivan and a pickup of 13. Should we be impressed that Joe Burrow is doing this in this offense in his first year in this offense? Yes, we should. Now, these are all skills that we knew he had last year. The offense didn't allow him to highlight that. But he, he's a coach's kid, man. He's, he's been doing this and reading defenses. Timeout, Vanderbilt. First timeout of the half. This will be a 30-second timeout. Thirteen, uh, pardon me, 31 to 10. LSU out in front of Vandy. And coming up at the half, you can watch the live performance of the Spirit of Gold on SEC Network Plus. Start streaming now on the ESPN app. Joe Burrow is 17 of 23 for 306 yards and three touchdowns, and we're still in the first half. How many possessions does he play in the second half? It depends what the score is. I think it's going to be tough to pull him out of the game just because he's a competitor, but they're not just dinking and dunking. That's what's surprising about this offense. They are pushing the ball down the field, attacking the weaknesses of the defense. You see here a couple nice throws on the outside. That one a great catch by Jefferson, and then attacking the middle, allowing his receivers to run after the catch. One of the reasons this offense has been so dynamic, something you really didn't see last year. And then the accuracy here. I mean, he is on full display with his anticipation, accuracy. He's a fiery competitor. But to be completing that high of a percentage in this offense. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not bubble screens and hitches, which just makes that, that stat all the more impressive. They're averaging 18 yards per completion in this game. <laughs> Burrow missed on two consecutive passes for the first time since the first quarter at Texas two weeks ago. This is going to be a big one. It's Jamar Chase again. Chase will take it to the house. A 51-yard catch and run for Jamar Chase. Second score of the day. I mean, he's so dangerous with the ball in his hands, but one of the reasons this is this wide open at the line of scrimmage, he makes a great move. On an in-breaking route, fakes outside, comes back inside, creates the space. And again, yak, baby. Yards after the catch. It's going to go down as a big number for Burrow on a nice, easy completion. And it's going to go down as big numbers for Jamar Chase. Seven catches, 199 yards, and three touchdowns on eight targets. Joe Burrow, the competitor, picking Vandy apart, and then afterwards, letting them know about it. You think he cares what the score is? He knows what the score is. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if they're up 50 or it's a one-point game. I mean, he is that guy. What was he doing there? Oh, I don't know, but his dad likes it. You know, his dad, I told you the story last week, his dad, was a substitute basketball coach when Burrow was growing up. And he got he got mad at Joe because he was shooting too much. And Joe talked back to his dad. He said, Dad, shoot or shoot. I'm going to shoot the ball. That's what I do. And he's taking his shots today to the tune of four touchdowns through the air. And 357 yards. What do you have, five in the first half? Touchdowns against Georgia Southern, I think, to open the season? Sounds right. He, I mean, he might have a shot to do that again. It's amazing. You want to know how the nation feels about Joe Burrow. His Heisman odds 
have jumped through the roof. Now he's one of the favorites after starting the season on the second page. And, and you know what? The biggest hurdle to the Heisman, he's already checked. He's had his Heisman moment. It may have been early, but he had his Heisman moment against Texas, and that's one thing that you're always looking for. Well, and I think the most important part in that regard is he'll have more opportunities oh, yeah. for oh, Heisman yeah. moments. Absolutely. Billy Cannon had his punt return on Halloween night against Ole Miss, and Joe Burrow will have bigger fish to fry later this season. Florida, Mississippi State, Auburn, Alabama, and AM to close the season all remain for Burrow, who's been untested today. I mean, that is stupid. 357? Two minutes for half? Come on. Derek Mason said we've got to be different. And defensively, they haven't been very different today. Georgia ran on him game one. Purdue passed on him in game two. And now Joe Burrow's picking up where the Boilermakers left off. 434 yards of offense for LSU in the first half. Miles Brennan happy. He's preparing for snaps in the second half, no doubt. Second string quarterback on the right. Incomplete. And you look at those numbers from LSU and, and, and you look at the Vanderbilt defensive side and you're like, how? How is this happening? Well, you lose a couple guys on the defensive side of the ball from last year and Jawan Williams and Donovan Sheffield that were kind of erasers. Guys that you could trust to win those man-to-man -man opportunities, which meant you could bring a little more pressure. You could get a little more exotic on defense and you wouldn't have to worry about getting hit for those huge plays on the outside. They don't have that. Jawan right Williams, second round pick of the Patriots. He turned yep. himself into an NFL defensive back. Burrow looking. Stingley had his guy locked up near side, and so Burrow on the run is able to find C.J. Buller. Pardon me, Neal on the run. Can you blame me? Every no, completed I mean, pass, no, I'm thinking yeah, it's Joe not Burrow. Not at all. And uh, Burrow's going to get another chance here, Tom. <laughs> How many times can you run two-minute offense in one half? <laughs> They've been running it since the first snap. That's what I was going to say. That's their offense now, which I never thought I'd say about LSU. Really? It'll be interesting. I mean, the Alabama game is the one everybody's pointing to. That's November 9th. That could be a shootout. Tyler Shelvin on the punt return team trying to blow people up. That one will hop and take a bandy turn. Almost ended up at Hattie B's. It's down at the four after a 64 yard punt. Joe Burrow has been excellent at everything he's done so far this season. He's a perfect fit for what Joe Brady has brought to this team. When Brady got first got here. He said, well, I didn't really know the personnel strength. I wanted to keep it simple. Well, I don't know if it's simple or not, but it's certainly effective. Burrow's numbers on the season by opponent. And he's already got 357 and four touchdowns in one half today. Glad Edwards Alaire. A spin move on the outside won't net him any more yards. But it looked good. D.C. Williams with the stop. All of last year against SEC opponents, Burrow threw eight touchdowns. He's already got half that in his first game against an SEC opponent. This offense is not just different. It's completely different. You got 33 Trey Slot in the Palmer or Trey Palmer in the slot right here as well. If you did want to take a shot, he's a super speed guy. A talented true freshman. It's getting a little more time as. Justin Jefferson, we saw walk off earlier, a little banged up. 
Timeout. Vanderbilt. The second timeout of the half. How's this for history? This will be a 30 second timeout. The 357 passing yards for Joe yeah. Barrow. 58 seconds onto the game clock. 58. In the first half is the most by any player against an SEC defense in the last 15 years at least. Wow. 437 yards of total offense. Joe Burrow must have been licking his chops because Vandy showed it was vulnerable coming into this game. Thank you. 126 in the country in total defense, which is a departure, as you mentioned, the personnel loss by Derek Mason, but a big departure from what was their strength last year on their way to a, a bold appearance. Yeah, and, and look, they don't have the talent that they've had in years past on the defensive side of the ball, Vanderbilt's defense, but Derek Mason is a defensive guy, and he's no slouch. One of the best coordinators of his time before he was the head coach here, and Jason Tarver spent his entire career almost in the NFL. So these are two great defensive minds that cannot bring anything up right now to slow down this LSU offense. Tarver is a West Coast guy. Cali guy, he said he spent a lot of time dusting off the old defensive playbooks to find solutions to a lot of the crossing routes and the levels that LSU uses. They spent a lot of time on that getting ready for this game, it seems. Vandy with pressure, and they'll get in the backfield and get to Clyde Edwards Alaire. It's McAllister with the stop. And that was a great job there. Timeout. Third and final timeout of the half. This will be a 30 second timeout. So Vandy wants to get the ball back with under a minute to go. They're going to be talking about this one, no doubt, on Thinking Out Loud with G Mac and Marcus. They'll break down the entire weekend on the gridiron. They'll break down that Notre Dame Georgia game tonight. Might be the most impactful game in all of college football this season. Thinking out loud right here on the SEC Network and the ESPN app. Yeah, you think an LSU guy and an Alabama quarterback are going to talk about how good this LSU offense is? That's going to be a fun one to hear those guys talking about it. As we all kind of look forward, as we shouldn't yet, it's, it's early, but we all kind of look forward and circle that one on the calendar a little more than we have in years past. Yeah, because because they scored zero points last year against Alabama. Right. The because last, that's been the difference yeah. for LSU. For how long? A you quarterback. Can't, you can't beat Alabama by scoring 10 points a game. No. Nick Saban in the Louisiana Athletic Hall of Fame said this week that the biggest professional mistake he made was leaving LSU. One of the most impactful moves in college football history. To the Dolphins and then to Tuscaloosa. Vandy going to bring some pressure. See what LSU checks to. Come from the edge. Ball lost. Alaire can't find it. It's in the end zone and recovered by Vanderbilt. Elijah McAllister, the red shirt freshman, with his first career score. Jason Tyra pointed out McAllister said he's had a good week of practice. We really need him to ramp it up. But this was a gift from Edward Zelaire, who never had control of it. LSU checks to his zone away from the pressure. Just maybe a little low, but that's that's got to be one that Edward Zelaire grabs with confidence and didn't look like they were on the same page there. LSU will get the ball to start the second half. The ruling on the field was a fumble and recovery for a touchdown. The previous play is under review. Elbow breaks the plane, right? Yeah, his, his knees was were down, and then it? by the time he got it, I think both his knees were off the ground, that elbow right on the white line, but it will depend. Well, here's why I think you look at the score and you say 38-16 as of now. This is why I think the score could be imperative in this game. If Vanderbilt is able to hang around, that will impact directly how many snaps or series yep. Joe Burrow plays in the second half. See, so knees down there, but it's up by the time. Yeah. That's going to be six. If, if the ball is breaking the plane, right? Tough to imagine, obviously, from this angle, but 
Tough to imagine it wasn't. When you grab the ball, you grab it into that crease of your elbow. So just seeing from that angle, the elbow on the line, I'm sure they had a better one down there. But you're right, it gets interesting now. I mean, you, if it's 38-10 coming out at half, you maybe give Burrow a one series, a one series and then move on now. I, I don't think that's the case. Riley Gay to kick. And he punches it through. McAllister with his moment. Courtesy of Allaire. Tell you what, though, this LSU offense, Joe Brady sitting up there next to Steve Ensminger. I don't think they're just going to hand it off and let this one go to half, though. I think we'll see a pass play at least in the first two downs there to see if they can get a chunk play and flip field position here, maybe make a run. One timeout, 50 seconds left. Late in that Texas game, Ed Ogeron on the headset asked Steve Ensminger, we're going to the four-minute offense here, run some clock. Ensminger said, no, sir, we're putting it in the air. We got another score. They'll put it out of reach. Line drive unreturnable. You still have an opportunity to help those affected by a Hurricane Dorian. Your donation will support Red Cross preparation, response, and recovery efforts in the United States and the Bahamas. Go to www.redcross.org slash ESPN or call 1-800-RED-CROSS to donate now. Saw Vandy bring some pressure as LSU was backed up last drive. I would imagine they're going to sit back in zone coverage here, try to keep everything in front of them. Burroughs thrown for 357 and four touchdowns. Primary target, target has been number one, Jamar Chase. Burrow, they got a hand on him, and then he slips down. Kenny Ambear, New Orleans native out of Holy Cross, was the first one to get there, and then Dale Dangbo cleaned it up. Well, Dangbo had a great move to the inside on the right tackle. Austin Deculus provided some pressure there as well. So that's how the first half will come to an end here in Nashville. Vanderbilt with a late score thanks to a fumble recovery in the end zone. And that'll make it a three touchdown game at the half. And we'll see what impact that has on playing time for Joe Burrow, the Heisman candidate putting up big numbers in the first half 18 completions and 24 attempts with four touchdowns chase with a buck 99 and three touchdowns the passing game has been on point for LSU almost as clean as the white purple white unis and the fighting tiger caravan showed up in Nashville and they got their money's worth both at the concession stand and in the stands the most productive first half, first quarter in school history. Cole Santa by with Coach Ogeron. You told us when we were discussing your running game earlier in the week that every time you want to try to run the football, Joe Burrow has a watch this moment. How many watch this moments did Joe Burrow have in that first half? <laughs> yeah, he's an incredible quarterback, but we got sloppy at the end. We shouldn't have that bad exchange right there. We got sloppy when we came down here. We have to play 60 minutes, but boy, what a half foul offense. And I know the injury to Michael Divinity hurts you, not just on the field with his production, but in other ways. What does it do to your football team and your defense? You no, know, Michael's a leader, but I think he's going to be back. I think he's going to be fine. When we get he and kill him on back, he's going to add to the pass rush. We had a couple of second teamers in there the first series. They didn't do their job. We put the first teamers in. We stopped them. 
Thank you, Coach. Go Tigers. There's been a productive day all around for LSU, even without Divinity and Caleb on chase on. Let's get you back to the studio. Peter Burns with Gene Chizik and Chris Doring. General Tom Hart alongside Jordan Rogers. We expected LSU's offense to continue rolling. Did you expect them to move at this efficient a clip? No, I didn't. I expected them to kind of ease their way into tempo as the game worked on, and they went full speed out the gate. If you're Vanderbilt, you're not going to stop them from completing balls, but take better angles because right now the yards after the catch for LSU is really what is making this offense really good and creating it explosive plays time after time. Oh, onside, onside kick. kick for Vandy to start the half. It's recovered by LSU, and the Tigers have a chance to return it. It is down to the two. Surprise, surprise. It's 44 the other way for the Tigers. The Hound does it. Micah Baskerville says, you want to give us an opportunity? I'll put us on the doorstep. I'm trying to figure out if I agree with that call or not to kick the onside. I don't think I do. You're down 21. Look, at some point you're going to stop them. Even if you get that, you score, you're still down 14. I mean, at some point you got to just fix the things on defense, trying to steal a possession here. It's actually a pretty good kick. Bounces around but falls into the wrong hands if you're Vandy. So Joe Burrow has two yards to go to put it in. And we got a flag before the snap. Snap, excuse me. You know, you think about it from Vandy's perspective. They had the defensive touchdown towards the end of the half. Practice snap, false start on the offense, number 77. Five yard penalty. So if they can build momentum by getting the ball back to start the second half, it, it could make sense. They're heavy underdogs anyway. I feel you. I don't, I don't mind the gamble. Look, I mean, Derek Mason, when we talked to him this week, he's like, look, we're playing with house money. No one expects us to win this ball game, so we're going to take some risks. A la an onside kick to open the first half. But you of all people, after your visit to the riverboat last week, should know the definition of house money better than that. Yeah. And when I, you, I when think you... they were starting in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too much house money on the table right now. They're borrowing from coal. <laughs> like I had to. <laughs> and that's been done. Joe Burrow passes the chips right into the end zone. And it's Racy McMath from six yards out. just too easy for LSU right now. Vandy doesn't have anybody on the outside that can lock up in man coverage and disrupt things at the line of scrimmage. So the slants, the quick throws are wide open. Five. That might be Ed Ogeron saying, how do you feel about one more series and then take a rest? <laughs> oh, boy. Five TDs. Just like I mentioned, LSU at the line of scrimmage, no matter who it is, is creating separation down here in the low red zone. Just a quick slant. Squares up the defensive back. And if you're a DB down the red zone, you got to be playing heavier inside leverage than that. Make them throw the fade. Make them throw a low percentage, but you can't play that off and not that far inside. That's It's just too easy. Joe Burrow has already set an LSU record with his fourth game with four touchdown passes or more in his career broke Matty Mock's school record for games with the four passing touchdowns and he's now tied a school record in a single game with his fifth if he, want, if he wants that SEC player of the week he's going to have to throw another one because two or through five again today to a tongue of a loa finish with five passing touchdowns and four incompletions in the win against Southern Miss and what will be a win so, relatively speaking, Joe Burrow's having a terrible game thing. He's got one more incompletion than he yes. does touchdown passes. <laughs> got to, coach, you got to put me out back out there for one more series. <laughs> By the way, the record that Burrow tied is his own. He threw for five against Georgia Southern to open the season. Let's go back down to the field. Our Banda Soleil man with the Central Pay tan. Cole, how's the sun? It's warm. It's out here. It's hot. They're beating up. But uh, it's interesting that you mentioned those slants, Jordan, because Coach Mason told me coming out of the half, 
that he has to find a way to slow him down, but he wasn't worried about the catches. He was worried about the yards after the catches. Said, we've got to eliminate the yak yards. It's killing us. However, we see that just getting open near the end zone can be effective as well. And that's the thing. I mean, I, I get it. And that's what I said. you got to stop the yards after the catch. you got to take better angles when these receivers do catch the ball. But you're inside the 5 or inside the 10. You can't give that guy 8 yards of cushion. Vanderbilt will run it on first down and lose 2 yards. Braden Fajoko and Andre Anthony back there. Remember, we still haven't seen LSU's defense at full strength. Richard Lawrence, Glenn Logan out with injury. Caleb on chase on, dressed out but hasn't seen the field today. And encouraging news from Ed Ogeron to Cole before they went in the locker room that Michael Divinity will be back. Certainly no need to bring him back out for Dave Aranda's defense in this game. But it looked like an ugly, costly injury at the time. This is Cam Johnson. And Stingley can't bring him down, trying to rip the ball out. And Johnson will turn it into another 15 yards on his way to a 25-yard gain. And that's just a young player trying to make a big play. And, and you love the, the instincts of Stingley to go after the ball here. But you got to wait till at least one other defender is there with you to help bring him down. That's when you can really start punching out that ball here. You got to do everything you can to get him out of bounds or bring him down first. Then when guys rally around, you can all go for the ball. Eric Stingley must have a great dental plan. He hasn't played with his mouthpiece in all game. Vaughn breaks through, makes the safety miss, and wins his foot race. Keyshawn Vaughn is off on a 52-yard scoring run. Second touchdown of the day for Vaughn. And a timely answer for Vanderbilt. This game has been teetering on out of reach really since the end of the first quarter. Without a touchdown here, it starts getting really out of reach. And Vandy just sticking around, sticking around. Three-point game. I mean, see, sorry, three-score game, three-score game. That means Burrow's going to be coming back out. Look out, Tua. Look out. There's still something left to prove. Riley Gay sneaks it in the upright. Vanderbilt gets a quick strike from Keyshawn Vaughn. Vaughn is over 100 yards for the first time this season. He's averaging better than eight yards. Moment brought to you by Allstate. Vandy opens the second half with an outside kick. And LSU turns it around on him. Taking it inside the five. To set up another LSU touchdown pass from Joe Burrow. He is thrown for five touchdowns and 363 yards. LSU has scored 40 points in four straight games this season. Just the third time in the AP poll era they have a streak like that in a single season. In the previous two instances, they reached the BCS National Championship and won it all in 07. It would have been 2007 and 2011. Well, any time we can get Sexy Rexy into a broadcast, we got to do it. And you look at historically what Joe Burrow has accomplished through one half. Tua Tunga Valoa with 17 passing touchdowns this season. It's the most in SEC history through the first four games. Burrow just one behind him trying to tie him today. And Rex Grossman in 01 did it with his first four games against Marshall, Louisiana Monroe, Kentucky, and a ranked Mississippi State team. Pretty good start in the fun and gun for Grossman back then. They put 44 on LSU in game number five. There's Jamar Chase again. And he breaks the tackle. This dude is something else. Sophomore from Harvey, Louisiana. Picks up nine. Joe Burrow continues his own school record. He has completed 20 or more in seven straight games. He's got Chase to thank for it. Here's Edwards Allaire. Stellar step to the outside. And he takes it for a first down. 
That's a gain of 25. Speaking of number one, Jamar Chase, he's the first LSU receiver since Odell Beckham Jr. against Furman in 2013 with a 200 yard day. Eight catches, 208, and three touchdowns. He should wear a watch. Here's Edward Zelaire. Gain of six. OBJ should be handing out those watches to Chase and Jefferson and Brian. Might, might have to wait until they. Uh, well, that's what I meant. After it was like, hey, I got this with your name on it. You know, <laughs> right, right. Once you're finished in school. It's only a $600,000 watch. Jeez. He's wearing a house on his wrist. Imagine trying to sell that on Instagram. Second down four. Out of the backfield. Edward Zelaire stayed on his feet and got him another yard. They think about this big picture for LSU. In years past, when it came to recruiting skill position players, it wasn't hard for opposing coaches and recruiters just to point at the box score and say, really, dude? Yeah. You want to go there? You might as well play in a triple option if you're going to yep. go there. Now, all of a sudden, Ed Ogeron, who's recruiting, has taken a leap in the last couple of years, especially with the extension out to the West Coast. Now, all of a sudden, you are a lot more appealing. He talked about that in his press conference this week. He said, now whenever I text the guy, that skill guy is calling me back immediately. Hilaire needing just one on fourth and short. See where the spot is. It's going to be just enough. No. Take a look at Let's it. Let's go old school. Let's bring out the chain. It's crazy about that streak of Joe Burrow and 20 completions. It took him seven overtimes last year to get 20 completions versus an SEC school. It was nice. the only, only time he did it. And this offense is just, it's so different. In the best way possible for, for Joe Burrow and what he was already good at and the talent they have on the edges now that are more mature than they were last year. That's an LSU first down. All right, I, I hate to pick apart a supermodel here, but what is wrong with LSU's offense in the sense of where can they grow? Well, I think still at some point, yes, it's, it's sexy to throw the ball over the field like this. At some point in the SEC, against few of the defenses you'll play, you have to have at least a little balance. You will have to control the game at some time. You're going to go up against a defense that, that will stop you at times. And I think a little bit of balance is going to be needed down the stretch of the SEC. And right now, I don't think they're quite there. Burrow's got all day. He's going for six. End zone shot knocked away. Maybe even more important, Jordan, situations like we just saw right there. Short yardage and goal line situations. Not even just milking the clock and try to close out a victory, but they're going to be teams that you're going to play that you have to score touchdowns against. You're not beating Alabama with field goals. So they're going to be short yardage and goal line situations where they have to come away with touchdowns. They have um, leaned towards the pass heavily as they have this season, which is such a departure from who LSU has been in their program history. Vandy dialing up pressure here, going man across the board, cover zero. Chase with another grab. That one goes for five. Cover zero, playing off again, take the slant. I mean, Joe Brady. And Steve Ensminger up there doing the check with me, and they're saying, okay, they're bringing everybody, but they're playing seven, eight yards off. Take an easy throw. Can't go broke taking a profit. Ground game. Turns into a first down. That's eight for the Baton Rouge native Clyde Edwards-Hilaire at a Catholic high. He's now over 100 yards. Joe Brady middle the screen. See Benjaminger in the far right. Kenny Airbear with the stop. See kind of hit and miss for that Vanderbilt defensive line up front. A lot of stunts, a lot of games, run stunts, twisting defensive linemen, trying to find ways to get guys in gaps. 
to take away some of these easy, simple runs. But on the flip side of that, you move a guy outside of a gap that they're running to could be a big game. And Vandy's in that stand-up look. No hands on the ground right now. They're going to play some games, try to get after Joe Burrow right now. Pocket holds. Another end zone shot. Beautiful pitch and catch. It's Jamar Chase again. His third touchdown of the game. Farmy's fourth. And it's 16-yarder there. Jamar Chase has been targeted 11 times. He has 10 catches, including four touchdowns. Great move inside to set up what they've been doing all day. Slant routes. This time sets up the fade route. Vandy brings some pressure, goes man. And again, nobody on the outside that can match up with the talent that LSU has out there. Joe Burrow has just set an LSU school record with his sixth passing touchdown of this game. This new look LSU offense is halfway to 100. And we're not yet midway through the third quarter. Joe Burrow. The grad transfer to LSU is playing games with Vandy. Jamar Chase cashing in. Garrett Schrader's beard against Sawyer Smith. That beard game is strong, even though it didn't get knocked out when he got helicoptered last week. You know, Grizzly Adams had a beard. <laughs> Garrett Schrader's beard, by the way, might be my favorite current Twitter follow. I mean, it, he's right up there, but still right behind Gardner Minshew's mustache. Right behind. It's close, but the stash is creating a legend of his own. Look at these numbers. Burrow's six yards away from 400. He's set an LSU record with six touchdown passes. Edward Zelaire is over 100. And Chase has 229 yards on 10 catches. You know, the... The accuracy, the precision, the efficiency of Joe Burrow this year is it's astonishing. And, and I got a lot of critique on how I evaluated Joe last year. But it's not only the offense. He's a better player. He's improved last year. He was bad at times in the red zone last year. 13 of 42 on the year. He was bad in the red zone. He was bad against good defenses at times. He is he is not only set up to be more successful because of the offensive scheme but he is more accurate than he has ever been on some of the perimeter throws the deeper throws i mean we're seeing a new offense and a much improved quarterback in his own right well and when we talked to him he pointed out admitted to you like hey i got a game where i complete 45 percent of my passes that's not good enough no that can't and we were kind of joking because i was sitting there with him I was like hey you know i know i've been tough on you and, and at one point he's like yeah you know well i was completing 44 percent of my passes so i get it Right? I mean, he's just so much better than he was this year. And well, what's amazing to me, and I, and I know he appreciates this, is the way he's climbed, forget about the Heisman conversation right now, but on draft boards based on this performance yeah. and the opportunities that are now open to him at the end of this season that would not have been there if he would have been in the same offense and the same quarterback. Absolutely. I mean, the efficiency obviously raises eyebrows and gets eyes on you, but even the things he's done to improve his arm strength. We were joking around about his time at Ohio State, how Urban Meyer hated to watch him throw because he had a weak arm. Said he threw like a girl. Threw like a girl, and so he went to improve that while he was at Ohio State. He worked hard on it this offseason, and he's throwing the deep ball more accurately and better because of that. Pressure on Neal. Can't escape the pocket. He gets popped from behind. It's Simone Clark who's playing in Michael Divinity's spot. He comes up with LSU's second sack of the game. Joe Burrow's got the helmet on. Well, there's some crisp looking first block. And now they add a special teams touchdown. It's that man again. It's Baskerville who recovered the onside kick. And now he comes in with the punt block. Give him the belt.
Hey, Micah Baskerville, you can impact the game on special teams. And he is cashed in today. Coach O a little fired up there about that one. He's seen the offense. He's like, I get it. We can score touchdowns there. But head coach, nothing that he loves more than seeing special teams come up with a big one. What a performance by this LSU team. LSU is the second school in SEC history to score 45 or more in each of its first four games. Alabama is the other. They did it last year. Left side of your screen. No, right up the middle. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, 41's got his eyes inside. He's got to be scanning. They haven't had one of these since Jacob Hester blocked it against Arizona State in 05, and Craig Stelts took it the rest of the way. And there's your required Hester shout-out for the day. As I mentioned a moment ago, second in school history. Alabama did it, pardon me, second in SEC history. Midway through the third, Ed Ogeron's team is cruising. Now I would guess Burroughs' day might be over. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Miles Brennan might have to mess up the hair. Only thing uh, Vandy's getting out of this one is the concession stand sales. Which, knowing LSU fans here in Nashville, yeah, probably yeah. pretty good. Might, might set a per cap record today. <laughs> Saturdays in the South is our eight-part documentary that chronicles the history of SEC football. Tuesday at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, part four will take you into the 1970s for a look at Bear Bryant's recommitment to the wishbone. Plus, the role of sports on TV played in the SEC, led by the voice of college football, the late, great Keith Jackson. You can only see Saturdays in the South right here on the SEC Network and the ESPN app. Neil wants to tee one up. And he'll go deep. It is blocked and taken down by Stingley. Cole, watching this LSU team over the last couple of weeks and the excellence with so many different units, it reminds me of the conversation that we had on the sideline watching an Alabama practice a couple years ago. When you have everyone on the sideline invested in your team and the team's success, even if they don't play key roles or they're not future NFL players, that's what allows a total team success. Yeah, it's called buy-in. And, and I think Ed Orgeron is a master motivator. You, you guys have been around him. You've been in meetings with him. I mean, he's, he's electric. He makes you want to run through walls for him. He's fun. He's energetic. He, and, and I think one thing that he does is find ways to get all of his players involved. And he competes in practice. He competes in things off the field, around the facility. And he makes it fun. I mean, there, there are a lot, and Jordan can attest to this, there are a lot of college football programs right now with what it is beginning to turn into that are not a lot of fun day in and day out. They're just not. It's very businesslike. You walk around that LSU facility, you hang around at Orgeron a little bit, it feels like fun. Now, you put 59 points on an opponent on the road, that makes it a lot more fun. But I think this program understands how to balance business, work, and fun. A lot of fun when you can start your day with a victory and end it at walk-ons before the sun sets over the Mississippi. Neal hit as he throws, but Vaughn will turn this into a positive play and a Vanderbilt first down. And you guys mentioned buy-in, too. I mean, nothing. I, and, and this is something that maybe LSU wouldn't admit or you might not have seen, but you played defense for LSU the last couple of years. There's got to be maybe even a little bit of deep-seated resentment, right, with how the offense hasn't been holding up their side of the bargain in some of the big games that LSU's had an opportunity to take that next step. So now this defense maybe has a little more buy-in. Seeing the offense put up numbers the way they do, that elevates their focus, their attention, their desire as well, not feeling like they're holding up their end and one side's not. I think that's a great point. And if you look at Dave Aranda's success prior to LSU, Neil, 
with the scramble and we got a flag on the play. It's his it's his ability to draw plays in the classroom to get exotic by giving his players more responsibility. And if the offense isn't scoring points, he's got to be more simple. Against an eligible receiver, number five on the defense. The penalty is 10 yards from the previous spot and includes an automatic first down. And as LSU continues to try to find ways to get after the quarterback, Dave Aranda must know that if my offense is going to put up 50 points a game, I can take more chances with my defense. I can maybe experiment a little more. I mean, you don't want to call it that, but that's kind of what it is. I mean, when you're in tight ball games and you can't afford to give up one big touchdown, well, you got to play tight. you got to play simple, like you said. Now that there's a little bit of a, a cushion, yep. for lack of a better term for Aranda, with what the offense can do, he can try more, for sure. Which, in the end, down the, down the road, it's going to be much better for that defense. Well, if nothing else, you can learn what you can and can't do. Right. And if there's a limit to what you can do, and there's no reason to go back to it. Vaughn dropped in the backfield again. Pardon me, that's Keon Brooks and Jacob Phillips with the stop. Dave Aranda came to LSU from Wisconsin, but when he was younger, deciding whether or not he was going to go into the coaching profession, he had a decision to make. He has a degree in philosophy, and he chose between coaching and divinity school. He is a critical thinker that will often go deep, deep into the weeds and break everything down for us in a measured but energetic tone. And he has been yearning to have a healthy defense. Neal goes deep. It is intercepted. It's the freshman, Derek Stingley Jr. He is keeping alive a wonderful football family name. Well, it was bound to happen. He's been following around Kalijah Lipscomb nearly all day. Time and time again, they battled, and he's won. And eventually, you just knew that he was going to come down with the big play. He's that talented. And LSU with the ball back on offense yet again. Tugga Bailoa handed off. That's a final. Bama wins 49-7 over Southern Miss. PB, thanks. Joe Burrow still in the game. Which 90s power would you rather be right now, Tennessee or Michigan? Don't answer that. Burrow to the slant. And looked like there was early yeah, action. It was trying to get Jure Jenkins a ball. I was going to say the same thing. Look, he was Probably there a little early. Well, how about Stingley? Pick for the freshman. They told us he was the best defensive back on the team last year when he was still a high school player getting ready for the bowl. Stingley's dad, Derek, played arena ball for a long time after being drafted by the Phillies. And he's grandson of the late Daryl Stingley, who played his college ball at Purdue and had his NFL career tragically ended in 1978 when he was playing for the Patriots with an on-field spinal cord injury after hit by Jack Tatum. So he comes from a football family and he's got a great football feel. Watch of Andy coming off the edge here. Burrow lobs it. It is too much. Terrace Marshall, the target. LSU has set an SEC record for the most points of the first four games of the season. Better than 2014 Texas A&M, 2015 Ole Miss, in 1996 Florida. Justice Shelton Mosley got his undergrad degree in economics from Harvard. He waits outside of his 40. Von Rosenberg with a beautiful punt and a fair catch taken. 48-yard punt. 59-24, Stingley back on defense after his pick a moment ago, back in a minute.
How good is Derek Stingley Jr.? Uh, the answer is really good, Tom. He's been matched up against Elijah Lipscomb, Bandy's best receiver all day, and he has made it really difficult on number 16, who's a good player. And you just knew at some point he was going to get both hands on one. Bunch of pass breakups, a couple good tackles, and brought one home. First interception of the year, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that not about dream scenario for a cornerback that's your first interception, your helmet flies off, and you're able to just kind of walk <laughs> around the field? Yep. <laughs> Uh, that's true. Show me. He didn't Rivals. even care. He was running around celebrating. He's like, oh, wait. Oh, I guess I should go get my helmet. Rivals had him as the number one recruit in the country. Uh, first down. Keyshawn Vaughn. There are some folks, Tom, and, and, and think about this. And this has been said in very serious context that he is the best recruit in the history of LSU football. Wow. That is a that is an impressive list and the family history is impressive with the Stingley family. Grandpa Derek, you may know his so pardon me, Grandpa Daryl, you may know his story. He was a fantastic wide receiver at Purdue before going on to the NFL. First round pick in 1973. batted away on the opposite side by Christian Fulton. Daryl Stingley, after taking the hit from Jack Tatum, had crushed and dislocated two vertebrae in Stingley's neck, severely damaging his spinal cord. He was rendered quadriplegic and would spend his remaining years in a wheelchair. He passed away in April of 2007 at 55 years old. Daryl Stingley's son, Derek Sr., Play pro ball, pro baseball for three years before switching to football. Longtime player and coach. And coaching to this day. There's the tight end Pinkney getting involved in it. Gain of eight. Cole, that's a heavy story, and those are heavy accolades that people would put on him as the best recruit in LSU history. What did, what would he have to do? to live up to that. Well, I, I think it's more highest rated uh, recruit in the history of LSU football, but it's, it, you can't say best right now when you have guys like Patrick Peterson and Leonard Fournette that have come through, but man, I, I think about what Pat Peterson did just at the same position when he was at LSU, and just to have a similar career would be unbelievable for any player. Fourth and one. How about Tyron Matthew? They're going to go play action. Neal back the opposite way. He's got Pinckney wide open. And Pinckney get, finally gets tripped up. Remember early in this game, it went for a fourth and one? Where was that one? Probably could have had the QB sneak again. Obviously, they don't like listening to me, so love it. Play action, hard play action. You sneak Pinckney from one side of the field. You see him down block there on 94 and just release. Really good job there by Riley Neal selling it to the wide side of the field and coming back late. Pinkney slowly makes his way over to the Vandy sideline. First carry, Gavin Schoenwald. Pardon me, Vaughn. And Vaughn is also slow to get up. Left leg. They've lost two of your key weapons on back to back plays. Keon Brooks looking for a hole. It's not there. If it was, it was quickly filled by Jacob Phillips. Well, has a nice job two gap in there by big Tyler Shelvin in the middle of that defensive line for LSU. You guys mentioned called his name a couple of times today, but when you can get somebody who can affect multiple run lanes with just one body that allows your linebackers to do just what you called out there, Tom.
Vandy will take a timeout. Timeout. Vanderbilt, first timeout of this half. This will be a 30 second timeout. Interesting halftime show today had a baseball theme and that would make sense with Vandy being the reigning NCAA College World Series champions. So Tim Corbin and his squad are out in the field to be honored today. Among the honorees, J.J. Blade, who was so good last year. Derek Jeter made a special trip to come watch him. Then they used their fourth overall pick on him. He's back on campus. He wasn't the only superstar on that team. Kumar Rocker threw a no-hitter in the Super Regional against Duke. He is a rising superstar. He will be part of a deep, deep draft class in two seasons. Tim Corbin's squad took down Michigan in the championship series. So we know about Kumar Rocker. Cole, tell us about his dad, Tracy. How good was well, that dude on the football field? You weren't blocking him. I mean, he would he'd run you over. Elite pass rusher from the interior of the defensive line. Lombardi and Outland trophy winner. He's nasty, man, and he's turned into one of the best defensive line coaches and recruiters in all of college football. Heck of a guy. Scott Brown had his pitchers out here yesterday. The pitching lab here at Vandy. That's Hawkins Field, which is almost connected to the football stadium. And the pitching lab, where they do all their advanced analytic work, is actually underneath the east stands of this stadium. So they came out of the dungeon to get some sunlight and throw on the field a little bit yesterday. Not uncommon. Here's Kalaja Lipston. Nice move, and he dances into the end zone for an 18-yard touchdown for Bandy. First touchdown catch of the season for the preseason all-conference wide receiver. And they were finally able to create a little bit of space at the line of scrimmage for Kalijah Lipscomb. Had a bunch or a stack set over there, which meant LSU couldn't play tight to the line of scrimmage. And he's dynamic. He's a guy that would play on a lot of other rosters in the SEC as well. And when he gets the ball in his hands, which has been tough for Vanderbilt to do tonight. He can make it pay. Gay for the point after. <laughs> Frustrating day for Riley Neal. He's took a lot of hits. Had a lot of tight coverage. He's tried to fit the ball in today. He's some really talented cornerbacks. So... Nice one where he had a little bit of an angle at least. Not much separation, but the formation allowed Kalijah to get off clean, and Fulton was there just a hair too late. You mentioned that pitching lab. You know, I used to go work out in that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I had, you know, shoulder surgery when I was here at Vandy, so I was like, I gotta wonder, I wonder what these baseball guys are doing. So I'd go in there, and I can't tell you all the trade secrets, but... You got the Rap Soto machine in there now. Yeah, it's pretty tell cool. You extension, your rotation. Not the only national championship baseball coach uh, in the building today. Paul Maneri made the trip to Nashville with several other LSU coaches, including Didi Bro, the gymnastics head coach, and Will Wade, the men's basketball coach. Always good to see the commissioner, Greg Sankey, in the building, too. LSU's got 10 guys within uh, 13 yards or so of the football. I remember Vandy started the second half with an onside kick. You wouldn't expect one here, would you? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. I doubt it. Maybe a little squib. Squib up the middle here. Got to cover it. Glad Edwards Alaire gets to it. And he sneaks free all the way past the 30. Wow. I don't know if we're going to see 59 points put up by anybody else today, but more games coming your way on the SEC Network. Kentucky and Mississippi State from Stark Vegas next. South Carolina and Mizzou will be on the alternate channel. Then later tonight, it's SEC Saturday night. San Jose State and Arkansas. If you're looking for that South Carolina-Missouri game, you can find the alternate channel in your area. Go to secnetwork.com. Joe Burrow remains in the game. He was thrown for 394 yards and six touchdowns. Hmm. Tyron Davis-Price. So, 
two best quarterbacks in the SEC perhaps the two best teams two of through five completed 78 percent Burroughs thrown six and he's completed 72 percent Yeah, two pretty average days. <laughs> I bet you they had a conversation with Burrow. Hey, you know, we're thinking about putting Miles in. Burrow's like, no, nah, I'm good. Just remember a, couple, me. remember a couple years ago when Peyton Manning was with the Broncos and it was late in the game yes. and it had been decided. And the backup quarterback was it Brock Osweiler? Couldn't it didn't get his time, helmet yeah. quickly enough. Yep. And Peyton just ran right by him and went in the game like, hey dude, it's my team. I'm gonna yeah. get as many snaps as I can. That's the, that's the kind of competitor Joe Burrow is. Peyton Manning used to lock the other quarterbacks out of the film room to keep them from competing with him when he was at Tennessee. Happened at least once. LSU will be looking at a third and two. How many snaps does Burrow have left in him today? All Tigers light up purple and gold, take it over and shut it down. Beer here before halftime. And the LSU fans were lined up and gave the delivery man a standing ovation as he brought in another truckload. I believe it. They ain't going nowhere. I believe it too. Well, this is just a pregame for, for Broadway. In you don't have to go home, hours. but you gotta get out of here in about 15 <laughs> minutes. Pressure on Burrow, takes a hit, got it away, and Burrow is back on his feet. And, and I think that's the that's the concern right now. Kenny Ebert, New Orleans native, put him on his backside. And number one goal here should be protecting your quarterback. Yeah, and he was walking a little gingerly after a hit earlier in the game. Again, takes another hit. I mean, these are just, it's just unnecessary at this point, right? 59-31. Sure. LSU's got a lot of things to look forward to in this season. I would, uh, I'd tell him, good job, Bob. We're going to stop you at six. Consecutive three and outs. And that one is going to trickle inside the five, and it's batted back. What a fantastic job by LSU. Zach Van Rosenberg will end up with a 51-yard punt. Jacob Phillips is a guy who got down there. Look at this play. You know, sometimes he's been making plays all over the field, too. I mean, his speed and athleticism, that's impressive. It's another special teams play made by this LSU squad. The onside kick return, the block punt, great punt coverage. Riley Neal back at quarterback for Vandy. Keyshawn Vaughn got bent back, lost the football. They whistled it dead because his forward momentum had been stopped. And that saves Vandy from coughing up the football because that was coming out. And Vaughn uh, doing little push ups. Let's see how many? Uh, 10? 10 push ups? Ball came out of his hands? Is that what it is? Is that yeah. going right these days? I guess. For a fumble? I know. I think maybe. You know, 110, maybe. Yeah. What are we talking about here? Burpees? Or just push-ups? <laughs> those weren't even even lock out on those. Oh. Keyshawn Vaughn is gone for 128 today. Here comes pressure from the edge. And two yards on the left side. Cole, what do you think about LSU's defensive line? Tough to really get a read, Tom, because we haven't seen Glenn Logan. We haven't seen Rashard Lawrence. No Caleb on chase on today. I like what I see from Tyler Shelvin. And Joe Evans got the start at nose guard today. He gives them a little more quickness up front, a guy that can move a little bit, a little more loose, can help in pass rush situations. But I like the middle based on what I've seen so far today. And a lot of new faces, so they're creating more depth. And there's continued competition among those guys they're looking to fill in for the likes of Lawrence and Logan and, and even Chase down on the edge. Neil chased and he gets tapped at the one. 
Damone Clark was waiting when Neal turned the corner. It's a loss of 11. For Braden Fajoko, 91, destroyed somebody at the line of scrimmage. It looked like there was some kind of miscommunication on the left side of the offensive line. Clark comes completely untouched. Great job by Riley Neal missing, making the first guy miss, but there's some of that pass rush we've been waiting for. Number left tackle Jonathan Stewart getting the opportunity to start today for Vandy, the sophomore from Lawrenceville, Georgia. He got some snaps against Purdue a couple weeks ago and in practice made his way into the best five. Harris Smith. And watch out here if Stingley gets an opportunity to return this one. If they get it off, he's going to have no chance. Good job kicking out of bounds. But that's going to be short. We'll see where they walk this one down to. An LSU quarterback, Burrow or Brennan, will have great field position after this. By the way, heartbreak for Ole Miss doesn't get easier. You're in Tuscaloosa next week. Good luck getting over that loss. Yeah. Around the SEC, Bama no issues with Southern Miss. Tennessee only managed three points in the swamp. First start for Kyle Trask since middle school, and he threw for 293 and two scores. Miles Brennan is now in a quarterback for LSU. Brennan, clean uniform, hands it off to Emory. By the way, these uniforms are clean, aren't they? Did you see the Twitter hit with Scott Van Pelt talking with Booker about trying to get LSU to wear these uniforms more? I love them. It's rare that they wear the purple on the road in the SEC, but I mean, this is so sweet. It's like a Sam Willard suit. White, purple, white. You love it? <laughs> Vandy decides to pull out the gray unis and league told LSU wear the purple. Can't wear white. If they're wearing gray. How many mannequins did we see in the LSU facility <laughs> last week with different uniform combinations? Here's Brennan. Got down in a hurry and is able to pick up five. Yeah, they got a lot of a lot of options. Walking into their locker room, they all line the entrance after you walk through a door that has no handle. It just opens for you. It's like yeah, a spaceship. It's very, it's you walk up Star to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> their facilities are un unreal. Absolutely unreal. Five wide. I'd keep an eye on this guy down here. Isolated. Brennan looking that way. That's complete. First down, McMath. 20 yard gain. He's taken advantage of his playing opportunity tonight. Yeah, he has. And you know, sometimes football is not as hard as everybody makes it out to be. You look to the sidelines, Joe Brady and Steve Ensming are up there. They go, well, there's no one else really on this guy. Let's throw it that way. And you got athletes, they make plays. Here's Emory trying to make a play. Left his feet and got pushed back by Randall Haney. Haney was unavailable for Vandy in the first half due to his targeting penalty in the last game against Purdue. And again, LSU using tempo in the red zone, something we didn't see last year. It's a new wrinkle. Here's Emery, and the freshman is in. Six-yard touchdown plunge will take LSU to the mid-60s. And you wonder, you know, why, why the tempo in the red zone, right? Well, you enter the red zone with Vandy trying to guard four receivers on the outside, so you keep them in that nickel personnel. One less big guy up front, you keep the tempo up. They can't sub. Now you have an advantage running the football between the tackles. Steve Ensminger told us last week, to be fair to Miles Brennan, when he gets a chance, I want us to run the offense, and we will run it as long as the head coach lets us run it. They've been running plenty. And I'm guessing LSU fans have darkened every door in this town, especially Lower Broadway. Tootsies is still open, guys. Those guys have had a day. Joe Burrow, six touchdown passes. Miles Brennan leads a touchdown drive on his first opportunity. And no opportunity for a return. Well, it's extra yard for Teachers Week. 
and they asked us to talk about our favorite teacher. It was easy for me. I'm keeping it in the family. And my mom, Susie Hart, who was my elementary school teacher, you've had the pleasure of meeting. I have. And so, Susie, here's a shout out to you. Extra yard for Teachers Week. We take you back among your 30 years of teaching. And as an educator in multiple states, XGR for Teachers Week is an annual celebration led by the College Football Playoff Foundation that honors great teachers across the country. Go to CFP Extra Yard or search the hashtag Extra Yard Week. Was she harder on you? Yes. I bet she was. Yes. I bet you were a handful. As a matter of fact, <laughs> one day in sixth grade, I fell asleep at my desk. She hit me in the back of the head with a book. <laughs> I said, hey, take it easy. My mom had me up cleaning my room all last night. Deuce Wallace in at quarterback for Vandy. Nothing doing. You have a favorite teacher? Yeah, Tony Carlisle, fifth grade. Favorite teacher I've ever actually took me to my first ever pro football game. I had a little wow. competition in, in class, and he had Niners season tickets. And me and my best friend Todd kind of, I don't know how, we we, we got, a, got the opportunity. He took us there. First football game I've ever seen. Probably swindled him a little bit. Probably. Him into it. Yeah. Congrats, Todd. You get your first shout out of the season. <laughs> Second down at 10. Deuce Wallace with Keon Brooks in the backfield. Wallace from Sevierville, Tennessee. Delivers a strike that is then dropped, and they will rule it incomplete. And Susie watching back home in Columbia, Missouri today. So Deuce Wallace who had a competition with Riley Neal for the quarterback spot in the offseason. They said it really came down to the very end between these two. Wallace came in late against Purdue. Saw some action against Georgia. Brother Chase plays baseball at Tennessee, and he lets this one go off his back foot and incomplete. This can't be an easy situation for Deuce Wallace to enter into. No, not at all. Um, but but good opportunity for the staff to continue to evaluate him. He's the quarterback on roster that gives a little more of the mobility using his legs, something that Vandy might need at some point as they continue to struggle to get consistent holes for Keyshawn Vaughn. But as of now, it's still clear cut. Riley Neal is the number one despite the competition in the first few games. But good that he's getting some reps here at the end against good competition. Brain Fajoko being tended to. LSU can't afford to lose any big guys up front. We'll be back in a moment. Oh, they've done it with every type of style. They've used the ground through the air. But nothing more impressive than Jamar Chase with the ball in his hands. And even when he didn't have it, making circus-like catches on the outside. Something Bandy couldn't stop all day. When he got running, he wasn't stopping it. Joe, you might need to throw up another finger there because he had six, not five <laughs> touchdowns. It was a big day. Yep, pretty good day. That's a passing report card. He had 199 at half. Chase did. That's it's unbelievable. Insane. Trey Palmer returned a punt last Saturday night at Death Valley for a score. He'll have a chance here. Oh, got one hand on it. Looking for a block. He got two of them. And that'll bring three flags. Palmer finally ridden out of bounds. Might back it up a little bit. 43-yard punt. Six yards on the return and three flags on the field. During her turn, personal foul, receiving team, blindside block, number 17. 15-yard penalty for the spot of the foul. First down. This is something you're going to see in big moments, I think, in college football this season. And to old school people, it doesn't look like a foul at all most of the time, but it is now. Yeah, and this is something they're really trying to get out of the game and see how high he was on that defenseless player. What he's got to do is turn his back to him. That's what these reps want to see. Turn his back, get in his way, but don't initiate the forcible content. It's very likely that they're reviewing targeting Yes, here. they are. And of course, that would impact LSU next time on the field. 
It is a defensive defenseless player. And Racy McMath has had a really productive day in the offense. Five catches, 48 yards, and a score. I think this is targeting, no question. Yeah. Indicator definitely rises up at least a little bit at the end there, but it's forcible contact to the head or neck area to a defenseless player. That's what they're trying to get out of the game. They want you to shield them off and not initiate that contact. We got our rules expert back in the studio, Matt Austin, watching along. Matt, what are the indicators that they're looking for trying to decide if this is targeting? Well, you already mentioned the big one. Uh, he is a defenseless player, so any hit above the shoulders can be targeting. Plus, he does lower the head. There is significant contact. Uh, I would not be surprised if they turn this into a targeting foul. Yeah, Matt, thank you. Did you hear that? Matt Austin said you were right. Wow. You know, when he used to white hat for the games I played in, he never used to say that. I used to tell him all the time, that's, come on, roughing the passer, come on. He's like, no, come on. That's the first time he's ever said I'm right. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, McMath would have to sit out first half against Utah State in a couple of weeks. After further ado, in addition to the blindside block, number 17 is being charged with targeting. By rule, he's removed from the main of the contest. LSU fans reacting the same way to the beer vendor when he ran out of pops. And that's this is a tough one for coaches because this is a tough instinct to coach out of guys because a couple years ago that celebrated sure. on the side that everyone's going crazy. I mean, you are a hero for those kind of hits. And a lot of times where that block occurs, that's the key to springing a big return. Absolutely. So the efforts there, it's just and I guarantee you, Coach O talks about what do you call him? Uh, Truth Mondays or tell the truth Monday. Tell the truth Monday. He'll put that clip up there and say, hey, I love the effort, but this is a learning moment. We can't have this happen. Here's how you have to do it. Tyrion Davis Price. Cole, what did you think when we were talking with Coach O yesterday about how he handles Mondays? I love that tell the truth Monday that he has and the thing that I liked about it the most is he said we don't really direct it at individuals it, It's all team based and it's how we need to improve It's things that we're not doing good enough areas that we can get better But they do also celebrate certain things as well, but he said we go out and throw for 480 yards We're not putting Joe Burrow up in front of everybody and say hey guys look what Joey did We're gonna talk about the entire offense why we had success throwing the football as an offensive team not just one or two guys well, he's got a lot of help over on that sideline at Ogeron does, including a guy he brought in this year, John Robinson, who keeps coaches hours, even though he's not officially a coach on this LSU staff. Robinson, primarily based in the West Coast for years, a couple of since as the head coach at USC, was the head coach of the Rams, has coached a couple of Heisman Trophy winners. And every Monday when Ed Ogeron shows up at the facility, John Robinson walks in the office and he has a list, usually about 10 items, and said, I've got some thoughts for you. There's uh, the legend. And Ogeron said, I, I've always had a mentor in many ways, a coach who's been through this before that can help me, that will tell me not what I want to hear, but what I need to hear. That is an, that is an incredible resource for him to have every day. And a guy, he says, grinds just as hard as everybody else. He's there at 6 a.m., leaves at 10. Cole, you had a chance to talk with Coach Robinson a little bit. What struck you about your conversation? Uh, just being able to throw back, talk about some of the big games that he's been involved in, coaching moments he's been involved in. I thought it was pretty cool. I asked him about something Ed Ordron told us, and that was when he was the interim head coach at USC, he invited Coach Robinson back, said, hey, I want you to come be a part of the program. I want you to be around the facility. And no other Southern California coach had done that at the time. Really did mean a lot to Coach Robinson when, when Coach O stepped out and said, I want you to come be around us. Well, they originally met when Ed Ogeron Ogeron would go across campus to speak every week. He and Coach Robinson would share a golf cart back towards a football facility where Robinson was parked. And what a great resource for these players to have. I mean, it's just an entire holistic approach to building a successful program. And that kind of role, he's allowed to think outside the box a little bit. And that Monday meeting that you mentioned with Coach O every week, this last week it was, hey, 
This guy you got a tight end, TK McClendon, I think he could play pretty well on the yes. other side of the ball. I mean, that came from Robinson. And now he's going to be starting in the goal line package, and he might have a chance to work his way into a, an impact player on defense when nobody else saw that. He was a tight end last week. Robinson grew up with John Madden. Dear friends, as Brennan takes it for a gain of nine, I believe third and short. Coach O said he spends his time with the offense. He's in the offensive line meeting rooms. You can imagine Coach Craig coaching that O-line, having a legend in there every day just to be able to bounce things off of. Pretty cool. Head coaches have found different ways to supplement their staffs in recent years with various analysts. Tom, I think it goes back to what you talked about, the culture of LSU football right now. And, and there is minimal ego from the top down. Ed Orgeron, obviously, you, got, you guys talked about what they did with that offensive staff, how they re-engineered the offensive staff earlier in the broadcast, how much leverage he gives Dave Aranda running the defense. But at the same time, Ed Orgeron will go down every day and practice and coach the outside linebackers one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he, he becomes their position coach for a couple periods. He's not afraid to take advice from anybody, not afraid to have guys bring other ideas inside the program. Zach Van, Von Rosenberg against a heavy rush gets it away. It won't be the prettiest. But he got it in the face of a rush to carry 24 yards. 607 remaining in the longest game in college football history. Kel, who is leading this fundraising effort through Turner's Heroes. Markel, it's had in from Wisconsin. Part of this fundraising effort today, they kicked off at kickoff with an 82 hour fundraiser. They're hoping to raise money to help fight cancer. And as part of that, Derek Mason has agreed to match whatever they raise over this 82 hours to $25,000. These battle ready uniforms for Vanderbilt include a helmet with 82 rivets in it to honor their former tight end who wore that number. And we had a great visit with Cody Markell yesterday. And he talked about that trip to MD Anderson meeting with his friends, oncologist Dr. Amy Hessel, who, by the way, is a Florida grad, and to visit the pediatric floor when they're at MD Anderson, and the inspiration to spread hope to youth who are fighting pediatric cancer, not just here in Nashville, but it's already been extended back to his hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. And what a fantastic story to come out of tragedy. I thought it was so cool sitting down with him yesterday. He knew nothing about this until this offseason fundraising aspect of it the research the grants that you can apply for and get that he's trying to help aid with this fundraiser he's been working on it all offseason offense not all 11 players were set for a full second five yard penalty remains first down the trip to md anderson last december came after turner cockrow who was an atlanta native passed away and it came in conjunction with Vanderbilt's trip to the Texas Bowl, and they had a chance to do a great fundraiser in Houston for that event. And surrounding that event, it was really cool how the Baylor players and the Baylor fans were involved as well. On first and 15. The entire line is moving. Turns into a gain of seven. Jamie on Marlowe with a chance to carry the ball here for Vanderbilt late in this game. That one was low but caught. Let's get you back to the studio, find out what's going on with Auburn and AM. All right, Tom, how about this? Auburn last year only had 19 yards rushing against AM. They've already got 67 thanks to world class track speed. He looks like Cole Kubelik right there. Anthony Swartz, 57 yards to the house. Tigers up seven zip. Anthony Schwartz is a track timeout. guy? Oh, yeah. LSU. I hadn't heard that. First time out this half. Cole, how do you handicap the rest First of that one at timeout. Kyle Field? Well, Anthony Schwartz piling up some rushing yards, but he's not one of the running backs that's going to need to do work tonight. If they're going to run the football, I think they need to do it out of four wide sets. They did it 14 times last week for 174 yards, but then protection comes a bit of an issue, and running backs are your extra protector. Here's Booby Whitlow. 
against Kent State, getting run through for a sack against Bo Nix. Malik Miller, one of your bigger, heavier running backs, comes in to help in protection. He's going to get truck sticked. These running backs in the Auburn offense, if they're going to find ways to create space and create yards in four wide sets, they're going to have to be good in protection because at some point in time, Bo Nix is going to have to put the football in the air. The Auburn running backs have been abysmal in pass protection this season. I believe that's going to have to change if that offense is going to find space consistently. That previous play is under review, trying to see if he got his hands underneath it and if indeed it is a catch. What have you what have you learned about Bo Nix to this point in the season? Well, I think he's a gamer. Obviously, we knew that from the fourth quarter against Oregon as we take a look at this play. But you know, when I look at Auburn as a whole, kind of through the context of looking at LSU, what is LSU doing so well this year? They're attacking the middle of the field. When I look at Auburn and you look at Bo Nix, kind of up and down, completing balls, a little erratic at times. They have attempted, Tom, attempted five throws from the five yard line to the 30 in between the numbers. That's a huge portion of the field that Auburn doesn't even try to exploit. So if I'm Gus Malzahn in a game where they're going against Texas A&M with a really good defensive line, they can cover on the back end, get some easy throws for Bo Nix. That would, that's what I'd be watching for early in the game. After further ado, ruling on field stands. Additionally, the replay booth was then able to contact the officials on the field prior to the challenge. Therefore, LSU is not charged with a timeout, nor will they lose their challenge. Seems like we've had a couple of buzzer issues from the booth to the field. So Bresnahan, the freshman from Cumming, Georgia, with his first catch out of West Forsyth High School. Pretty big one in the Classic City tonight. Notre Dame is in town to take on Georgia. I think I'm going to get home just in time for that. I think I think my flight lands about 10 minutes before kick. Uh, you think this game's going to be over before that that's, one starts? That's true, actually. Four, four minutes left. We got 97 combined points in this one. And five timeouts remaining. Deuce Wallace wants to let it go. Too much. Cole, what do you think of Georgia and Notre Dame? I'm not sure this Notre Dame defensive line is going to be able to stand up to the best offensive line in college football and keep Swift and Harriet and company from piling up rushing yards. Notre Dame's allowed 19 rushes of 10 yards or more this season. Only 13 teams have allowed more. All 13 of those teams have played three games. Notre Dame's played two. Georgia fifth in the country with 26 runs of 10 yards or more this season. I expect they will have a dominant performance on the ground. Second down here for Vandy and Deuce Wallace. From exit 407 of the West End. And that one's intercepted by Jacoby Stevens. Put a cape on that dude. What a play by Stevens, a junior from just down the road in Murfreesboro. And that's just a, a great break on the football and a bad decision and bad throw by Deuce Wallace. You're throwing a go right on the outside. If your receiver does not get outside leverage, that ball's going to be thrown on a line because he's now five yards closer to that safety playing single high, reading Deuce Wallace's eyes. That's the reason. Look at that. Not even outside the numbers. That ball's got to be thrown on a line or it's going to get picked every time. Jacoby had a great break on the ball. So LSU's offense is back on the field. Going back to that Georgia-Notre Dame game, can Ian Book be a difference maker? Can he be enough for Notre Dame? I think he can. Um, he can make some plays. Now I'll say it's got to happen outside the pocket, and that's what I'll be watching as Georgia looks to try to find some semblance of a pass rush. Here's Emery, and he's finally checked down a gain of 21. As Georgia tries to establish themselves and find their pass rush, they got to be careful of not rushing past the level of the quarterback. If you rush too far upfield, that's when you give Book the ability to get outside the pocket, and he has zero incompletions outside the pocket this year. He'll make you pay if you give him an opportunity. But again, I see Georgia wearing down Notre Dame at the line of scrimmage, and I don't think it's that close at the end of the game. Kirby Smart. New defensive coordinator Dan Lanning wanted to increase the havoc rate this year for Georgia. They've done that to an extent, but still improvement to be made in that area in terms of pressure on the quarterback, hits on the quarterback, takeaway. And that could be a key tonight. First top 10 matchup at Sanford Stadium since the 1960s. Let's take it back to the studio. Thank you, Tom.
Now, what to watch for brought to you by our friends over there at Liberty Mutual. Tommy Stevens in street clothes will not be playing for Mississippi State. Remember, he got injured against K-State, so it'll be Garrett Schrader going to get the start against Kentucky. Remember, the Bulldogs have won eight of the last ten against the Wildcats. That game coming up in about five minutes. Garrett Schrader's beard. Schrader's beard is down at Tootsie's on Broadway right now. <laughs> Getting ready for the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know what? He's, He's more of an East Nashville. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Intercepted by... Oh, but there's a flag on the play. Yeah. Back in the backfield at the 30. As it stands, it's a 42-yard interception return for Haney. And Brennan took a huge hit as he released that ball, which probably led to the location and allowed Haney to step in front of that one. They shot the fireworks off, but they might be taking those points off the board. They might be looking at roughing the passer here. I'm trying to figure out where that flag's laying. He takes a need to hurry this up. Personal foul. Targeting number nine of the defense. Prior to the change of possession, 15 yard penalty, previous spot, automatic first down. The previous play is under review. Caleb Peart, the linebacker, number nine, the one charged with targeting. This will be an interesting one. It'll wipe the interception away whether or not it was targeting. See. <laughs> His head doesn't necessarily lower, but does he raise up at the end there a little bit? I'm trying to. There's definitely forcible contact. See, his head doesn't dip, but there is contact right above the face mask of the, de the defender, which you would kind of classify as the crown of the helmet there. Well, let's bring Matt Austin in. Got a couple of looks of that back in our studio back in Charlotte. Matt, what do you think about this play? Well, I, I agree with Jordan. There is definitely uh, an attack. He does ha have a, a slight upward thrust into the head or neck area. And I do think this is the definition of head or neck area. He doesn't get him with the crown of his helmet, but he does get him almost in the ear hole or just below it. So I do think we have a defenseless player. We do have an attack, and we do have forcible contact to the head and neck area. So I think they're going to go with targeting on this one. Checked all the boxes, Matt. Thank you. Just what do you want a defensive end to do? Hit him lower. He, get, he gets around the tackle, and he, well, he's already low. Yeah, but you, you got to get your head out of the way. You see how his face mask stayed square? After further review, there is no foul for targeting. Wow. Therefore, the result of the play is a touchdown. Was there not a personal foul in addition to targeting? I thought that's what he said in the initial call. I'll get Matt back on here. Uh, touchdown stands for Haney. If that personal foul happened, I mean, obviously it didn't happen at the conclusion of the play because the play was still going on and led to the interception. It's Maybe I missed her, but I thought we had roughing the passer prior to targeting and in addition to targeting. Yeah. 47 yard return. So Haney he gets his first pick and it leads to a touchdown. Available at the moment. So I, 
Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, co I'm confused why we had a personal foul penalty with targeting in yeah. addition to targeting. Targeting is taken off. The personal foul penalty should have still stood. Yeah, I agree. And, and to the targeting, they must not have seen the attack. And that's really the word that these refs are looking for and trying to see the intent in the attack. You saw forcible contact to a defenseless player, but they must not have seen enough of an upward thrust. Because there wasn't a defined crown lowering of the helmet, you need to see an upward thrust and attack, and they must have deemed it not quite enough to call that target, which I'm not sure I agree with. Yeah, that's, that's something where he wants to to do it but if you want to watch the end of that LSU Vandy game God bless you that game is going over to ESPN at news but right now let's get you out to Starkville Mississippi